Um, great. So that was moderated by Ms. Olivier, the ES of the American Peace Council. And then she will call on her fellow panelists to sort of discuss the role of the EFD in inter trade for the creative sector. Oh, Ms. Olivier, over to you. So uh, thank you, Joseph, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we're just joking about um, you know the usual African time, the fact that the business not get pulled up, but I think we need to um, learn to respect uh, the time without without uh, wasting much. And I'd like to introduce uh, the panelists, I would say. Um, so I have with me here. Should I even start with those words? Um, so I have Jamie, um, Jamie Moody. Uh, Jamie is the Deputy uh, Counselor, Economic Counselor for the US Mission in Nigeria. She's joining us online. Um, I have uh, Dr. Ike Chukobiaya uh, from the Pan Atlantic University. She's Also here, I have our uh, Rini uh, Makama. She's not even able to see. I did mention that uh, Rini um, works in Microsoft. She's a uh, director for the, I, I still struggle with having the Microsoft project. The Xbox project. You know, because uh, Rini and I have gone along with really doing other things. So. I still, I still really hope that we work together. So each time my memory kind of blacks out, every time I, I think it of that was a conversation with that. It can be the left. Um, I also have here with me uh, Mr. Peter from the um, ASCFTA. Okay, is there anyone I left out? So, thank you so much for making our time going all the way from Ghana to represent the second Yes, okay, you're going on Google. Okay, so I put you in. Okay, so we're going to start. I said, I hope others will join. Um, it's a challenge that you have to talk and then you pass it on and then your your glasses get all the nice green and then you're the wrong thing, but if this is a new world, you know. So we would um we all know for instance that um the purpose of the um AFCFT is to build one single solid um, economic area, um a solid viable market uh, with uh, one point two million um, persons um, and, and having some interesting uh, demographics um, so they like us on the a lot of products especially in the, the creative uh, the creative and cultural um, industry products and services so so um, plus, plus the fact that we have some extremely viable uh, economics, fast grade economics in the same continent. So with, with all that also comes the with all that also comes the the fact that you know you also that we're having uh, technologies growing at a speed and pace you know that um, are also unprecedented in this part of the world. Um, the digital space is growing, people are internet penetration is increasing and creating a lot more access to the creative um, and uh, cultural um, industry products and services. So uh, today we're going to be looking at, um, you know, how a lot has to be done in the area of, we are doing in the area of policy, but in the area of, of uh, capacity, and even overall, the overall business and the, uh, you know, texture of the, of the sector. So I really would, um, like to um, do things a bit differently. I'll introduce uh, the panelists, but I would like them to just give us like 
a need to introduce themselves. Good morning. My name is Ike Chukugaya. I'm a lecturer in the School of Media Communication of Atlantic University. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Rudy Matama. I am the director of international market expansion for Xbox. How um, are you doing? This is my next project. Good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, you are so welcome. This excellency is the Secretary of the African Continent of the Thank you very much. Yeah, okay, so while I, I shared that, was I wanted you to talk about um, the space you exist within the context of this conversation. And so, since we're all very coy about our speech, Jamie, uh, okay, well, I'll introduce that. Um, um, yeah, so um, I wanted you know, also share. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, oh, understood. Um, why am I here? So in my personal capacity, um, I work, I moonlight in the film industry. So not in a necessarily organized way, uh, but I am, I am a partner in a production company called Cyrus Film and Production uh, with my brother, Abba Nakama, who is a film director. Um, I'm excited to produce two movies. Um, Green White Queen in I think it's struggling with the date now. I think it's 2017, 2016, 2017, which went to over 20 international festivals and it's on Netflix for two years. And The Lost of Koroshi, which is currently on Netflix and is still making a few rounds in international festivals. Apart from that, we've worked with various companies to produce. Documentaries, one of our documentaries was on Al Jazeera about the history of Nigeria a couple of years back. Um, I am a silent observer of the industry. Um, I'm like invited to be here to just share my thoughts on capacity building and the involvement of government and just general observations around how Nigerian film can progress globally. Thank you. Well, I do not moonlight in the in the film industry, but it's an area of research for me. My research has an element is very much in the industry. And it's also, I could say, uh, an area of passion for me, but also in the context of the wider creative industry. It's, it's a fascinating thing, especially what we see going on in this country. It's eventually exploding as a creative space. And in my professional field as well, as um, education, it's something that we in our university are very much focused on in the aspect of capacity building. So many of the programs we do at the rest are trying to provide the necessary skills for this space. And so it's something that, well, Passion added to the skills, and one really see, see the possibilities of what can be done, and that's very much the part of what I focus on. Yeah, I mean, I would like to hold on to micro microphone because I going to ask you the next question, or at least that. Um, so, uh, you know, every time we talk about these intellectual property issues around the creative uh, industry, is 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 some a lot of challenge to put in uh, we have issues where you know the laws are weak, some of them are still struggling to have them passed and over the years. And I remember a woman saying that um, when she when we started the conversation around that case, she didn't have a, a, a child was just born and I think a child is about 22 years or so right now. Uh, this was two years ago, she said, so you can imagine how long this has been. And um, with weak laws, um, you know, in Nigeria for the creative industry, and then having to see that we are going to be playing 
in a larger economic area in this beautiful paradise type, you know, ESFT market. What do you really, how do you think that um, the creative industry can kind of navigate um, these challenges and, and still survive? I mean, while we're still pushing forward, what is, how do you think we can run this way? Well, well, when people talk about weak laws, actually, some people have said we have some of the best laws in, the, in this space, the copyright space. Yes, there are certain things, for instance, the digital, things to do in the digital space are not so well covered by the laws. And I think the law right now has a bit of comfort, has gone through various readings in the House. Last I heard, it's almost at the point of being approved. So that, yes, that is coming. However, I'm not so sure that the problem lies with the laws. It's more the aspect of enforcement. Even in spite of the fact that, yes, people may not have been happy with all the provisions of the previous, of the existing law, the key problem has always been that of enforcement. Now, how are we going to function in this space? One, I think those of us in the space, the practitioners themselves, also have to equip themselves in terms of the knowledge of the law in terms of what their possibilities are. You will see that a great problem if I, if I refer to what goes on in the film industry, for instance. The aspect, I mean, this is just a legal aspect, the aspect of contracts, that many people get involved in projects that they were contracts, for instance. And so a big part of the problem is that we all, first of all, have to push what is on our side. Now, this is all part a gain of the aspect of capacity. People have to have a better understanding of what is required in their own space. So how are we going to function with all those laws? Well, if each person understands what his or her rights are and begins to this push for that, we will not be able to protect ourselves in everything when piracy comes in. But I know of one filmmaker who, some years back, he studied the space and as a way of protecting himself, decided to push out his content only in a particular form. And he succeeded to that extent, protecting his way from being pirated. So I think in the absence of external forces that will protect us, we in this space have to then study the thing, improve our own capacity, our own knowledge, and really putting structures that we can control. That for me would be a key part of that response. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. I mean, you talked about capacity. And, you know, when we, we think about the creative and uh, the, the, the creative and cultural um, industry, we always look at it from the point of view of the artists or the people. You know, so but there are different staples and staples as dotting the ecosystem. So I'm going to be uh, moving right to reading and ask, uh, you know, what are we going to be doing or what do you think we should do in terms of building capacity in the ecosystem? Um, thank you. Uh, I think the whole value chain involves not just private sector but government as well. Um, I remember back in the last administration, there was a grant scheme for filmmakers called Project Act, and um, it was millions of dollars. I don't remember the exact sum. I think previously, in 2011, about a $200 million loan was given out to the industry. But the following administration gave out grants which didn't need to be returned. And it was meant to improve distribution of the production. Um, we were a recipient of one of those grants. And in fact, in one of our movies, we did credit Project Act in it. So I can actually attest that it, it did work. Quite a couple of people in the industry got it. But there are so many other ways that the government uh, can be involved. The regulatory bodies, the censorship board, first of all, the name is quite scary when you start with censorship as a form of regulation, but it does do a good job of tracking statistics and letting you know how many movies are produced or bought up by year and how much it contributes to the GDP of the country as well. Uh, but there could be so much more we can do to formalize things from ensuring that we have curriculum in universities. Um, we have theatre arts currently, and it's not taken as a serious discipline per se anymore. I remember back in the day, it was, 
um, because there was an industry which people could go to immediately afterwards. Uh, we had a thriving lesbian community. It is growing now, but when people think about the creative aspects, we're usually thinking about cinema and being short of the film. Um, we have here, I believe, the New York Film Academy. Someone has a large over here. Um, but it's not enough because there's so much more that we can do, even an association like the American Business Council can partner with um, international partners to do training with the US mission um, to bring in directors. Film festivals are a great way to build capacity. Currently, Africa is going on. Um, I believe Amazon is here. The chief marketing officer of Amazon, who happens to be Nigerian, is currently here with the whole team from Amazon that meets with people. Netflix is also forming in Africa. So the value chain is improving. Um, but then there's tons more which can be done to educate even the players in the industry, script writing. Uh, there's always this joke about our, our movies don't have scripts, which by now is not necessarily true. Uh, a lot of the films have scripts, but I don't think we have enough writers because we have not encouraged that necessarily as an industry which people can get properly paid. But writers exist. Um, we can have standardized pay. Why do we benchmark salaries for technology for finance, but there's no benchmark for the film industry. It is a proper industry which contributes to GDP. So film actors also need that protection. They need to be able to have insurance. They need to be able to know that there's a available, that they can get paid in a movie. They need to know that there are safety regulations when they're working on a production. And some of these things can be started by the government, but it's a combined effort. I was reading um, something the Deputy um, Speaker of the House said about the importance of many groups to setting the tone for culture. Um, a lot of the films are a lot of lived experiences, but they're also so powerful because a lot of people watch Nigerian films internationally, locally. So it's a great way to pass on our culture and our heritage. Another good thing we can do is international partnerships. Um, recently, uh, my brother and a couple of his colleagues have a collective called Zero 16, and they partnered with a French producer. And um, the French embassy backed this production as well by premiering it here in Lagos, having a premiere internationally, and also making sure that it had distribution of French cinemas across French West Africa and Canal Plus. And it's the first sort of collaboration with. Um, the French embassy, and there's a lot of emphasis, and I know this is the American discussion. The French are, are really moving in to participate in the creative sector from the cultural center they have where they promote the arts. And the engagement that they had a few weeks ago, there was a, they moved the whole people from um, the fashion industry to train them in France for the training. So, we can have these sort of international collaborations with the different international missions that exist here as well to bring that expertise. Um, and finally, I would say, we always say that our stories are powerful. And I think it's a, it's a thing that Nigerians have. We seem to think that we have the best stories in the world, which is not necessarily true. Everybody has stories. It's like the, the dollar price thing, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's the way we tell the students, it's the way we position ourselves. When people are watching um, American films, they are watching them globally. They are not just made for Americans. And so it's the same way that our films should be made by Nigerian filmmakers for international consumption. So not just made for the Nigerian film industry. I think that's something that should be borne in mind when we're producing and thinking about capacity. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, there was something you said before we, uh, or there's something you mentioned about partnerships and uh, getting the US, um, um, well, getting governments outside, uh, for instance, the French uh, government involved, um, and uh, looking at possibly uh, working to accelerate um, or energize the space uh, through this uh, partnerships and best practices from these other countries. So, um, we have Jamie um, with us here. Um, so Jamie, Moody, can you please introduce yourself? And then while you're there, we have to catch up with you. Um, yeah. 
the fuzzy, the new, our new way of life. Um, so, yeah, you can eat. So, uh, can you share with us, well, after introducing yourself, um, the kinds of best practices that you, um, you think um, could help accelerate what we have in, in country? And, uh, well, I, I guess I'll move to the second question. Sure, and good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Jamie Moody. I'm the Deputy Economic Counselor here at the Embassy in Abuja. Um, there's so many ways that I can answer this question, and I think I'm actually going to cover some of the things that the previous speakers mentioned. The United States has a very dynamic and diverse creative industry, and creative talent in the United States, whether it's from gaming or writing or acting or, um, you know, music is, is cultivated at a very early age here, um, whether it's through summer schools or uh, school programs, uh, online communities, um, a lot of opportunities exist for the youth to be put on the pathway to contribute to the creative industry. And a lot of this is supported by public funding. Um, so there's also significant state, local and federal support for the creative economy because the United States government recognizes that the creative economy is a contributor to the overall economy. Um, there was a report published earlier this year by the National Endowment for the Arts that said that the sector contributed $920 billion to our economy in 2019. And it also contributed to a surplus, a trade surplus between 2006 and 2019, that was more than 33 billion. So as such, the, the creative economy in the United States is respected and it's nurtured and it's treated as a potential driver of economic growth. So you'll see that in addition to the study abroad programs or the different training programs we have for the youth, that there are also lots of incentives that happen at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level. Um, so one example, of course, is the film industry. So everyone knows about Hollywood, everyone knows about New York City, but we also have various tax incentives that really incentivize uh, studios and filmmaking and projection and things to happen in states like Louisiana and Georgia. And so you'll see that what happens is like a, a cluster effect, a multiplier effect. And so people come here, they produce movies, they set up studios, um, musicians, local musicians are able to contribute to filmmaking, gaming and visual effects studios come up, people start studying at school, in school, and there's this, this, you know, this cycle that comes and a multiplier effect and this impact really um, happens at the, at the local level. Um, and then we, we protect this work via our laws, you know, intellectual property, entertainment laws studied in school. And I know that one of my colleagues here from the Department of Justice will go a little bit more into IP and the different legal protections we have for this work. As far as other ways that countries can learn from the United States, you know, people come from all over the world to study at our universities, be represented by our agents. Um, and to work in these different firms, but we, we also do our part to, to share this both overseas. And so you mentioned that Africa is going on and we actually have a project, the US Mission is partnering with the Global Media Makers, which is a US-based post-production uh, expert team to train Nigerian filmmakers. I think 25 Nigerian filmmakers are receiving some training. Um, we have virtual exchange programs with Nigerian fashion designers, but we're teaching them um, how to collaborate with US experts and then teach them how to export. And then we have a women's entrepreneurship fund, which also um, helps women get the business skills and the networking skills to export uh, overseas. And so there's many ways that we're trying to share best practices and be open and to share the US model. Thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, I'll get back to you um, on a couple of um, some thoughts around partnership. But let me go to Peter. I don't think we have uh, happily alone and uh, not answered any questions. Uh, sorry, we have to keep doing this. OK, so Peter. At the AFCFTN, um, what do you think the AFCFT should be advising countries on, you know, how to um, leverage by what we the strength of those um, products, or the creative uh, products and services, um, to, to in order to really uh, improve our yeah, economic growth? Um, how best can 
EFCFT really help um, accelerate economic development of the continent you know, through, um, through this space. Um, thank you very, uh, very much. Um, so, as I said earlier on, um, uh, Peter is the main um, senior advisor to the um, assessment um, prior to um, um, this event, I worked um, uh, in Abuja for many years at uh, where I directly worked on um, uh, on IT. Um, on IT. Uh, but to answer your um, um, your question, we didn't get to understand the framework for um, for the ASCS and then where IT where the creative sector. Um, um, so, as um, some of you may recall, um, the ASCSC agreement um, is actually in three layers. Um, so, we have the agreement establishing the ASCSC, um, which then sets out um, um, the objectives, and the scopes, and then at the scope, and then um, um, other elements of the institutional structure, and then the other elements of the, the, the ASCSC. And the second component of the ASCSC, or the layer of the ASCSC that we have, is the protocol. So, as some of you may um, uh, may have heard, we then had phase one and then phase two um, pieces. So, we then had um, trading goods, um, trading services, and then rules and procedures for the settlement of disputes, uh, which um, we have negotiated in, um, in phase one. There are a few outstanding issues we are still looking at um, when you uh, when you have a look at. Um, the, 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 the phase one issues. Now, in terms of IT and the creative sector, we have these two issues. So, um, our heads of state decided um, we should have negotiations on these two issues. So, investment, digital property rights, um, digital trade. And then there's also another component that was recently added December. Um, in 2020 at the Ekadi Extraordinary Summit, which is women and youth in trade. So this is the framework in terms of where IT sits in the framework of, um, of the AFCSU. Of course, there's a third element, which is the annexes we have um, to the protocol. So the first layer I said is the, uh, is the agreement establishing the AFCSU, which then is overarching the protocols where IT is and then we have um, we have the, um, the analysis. The other key question that may come um, will be where are we now in terms of all of this, with specific reference to IT, uh, because that's part of this too. We are yet to commence the <coughs> negotiations on, on those issues. But um, for the this one, we've gone a long way. So if you look, for example. As rules of origin, we've achieved a lot. So currently, <clears throat> currently what we have is that we've achieved um, eighty seven point eight percent of the uh, of the tariff lines that we have to complete. That's about about twelve point two percent that we are we are yet to complete. Then when we come to uh, the tariff negotiations as well, we've also advanced a lot. We've got the three countries submitting their offers to uh, uh, to us. Now, coming to the IP, as I said, we are yet to begin the negotiations on that aspect. However, at the last minute, uh, meeting of the Council of Ministers uh, in uh, May uh, 2021, what they basically did was establish a committee uh, on intellectual property rights. So basically, that's where the negotiations will be, uh, will be, will be taking place. But before you can understand where the committee sits, you know, when we're having the negotiations, we had an institutional structure. So the institutional structure was um, at the top, we had the assembly of heads of states, which of course includes um, our president. And we also had the African Ministers of Trade, we had the senior committee of senior people officials. We had a negotiated forum where the negotiations were taking place. That was the institutional structure we had for the negotiation. Now, in terms of the implementing structures, at the top, we have the assembly, which of course again includes Nigeria, which, which of course includes um, 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 our president. Then now we have council of ministers. Um, so basically, they make key decisions. 
So one of the decisions that we'll be making is of course on the on the IP, of course, on the on the, on the security sector. Lower down, we have a committee of senior field officials. So this is where the permanent um, secretaries will end meet and then also make recommendations to, 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 um, um, to the ministers. Then we have the committee. So the committee is where the future negotiations on IP will be, uh, will be taking place. Now, I said that we have not commenced the negotiations yet, but the other key question that we have is also with the importance of having an IP protocol or an IP framework at the continental level. Uh, the key thing is to uh, boost in Africa and in country. And even if you look at the agreement establishing the ESCSA, it then provides a number of objectives and then specific objectives. One, of course, is um, the foundation for a continental um, 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 customs, um, comes customs union, given the fact that the ASCSA is, uh, is a free trade area. Another key one is also the fact that if you look across the continent, uh, we have overlapping metrics. So you have one country belonging to um, two or three uh, um, regional economic communities. It is also happening in the, in the area of the uh, of IP. So the first uh, key thing is that we want to um, um, to boost in Africa. And the other key one is also having a predictable environment for IP protection. That currently, if you look at the landscape, um, the multilateral framework that we have, of course, it's great, um, great um, related aspects of um, intellectual property rights um, at the uh, World Trade Organization. But across the continent, what we notice is that not all the 65 African countries are members of the, the WTO. That also would mean that we don't have a level playing field. We don't have the same laws applying across the 55 countries. And to be more precise, we only have 44 of our member states um, that are members of um, um, the, the World Trade Organization. So what then happens to the other 11? Algeria, Ethiopia, Victoria, Guinea, Sao Tome, and Principe, they are all not members of, um, of, the World Trade, um, of the World Trade Organization. So having a continental agreement or a continental protocol of IP uh, right, it needs uh, very good. So, which is also the second other reason why we needed to have that to avoid that discrimination um, uh, 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 across the Now, the other key component to also address then is that given the fact that I said we are yet to comment, and I'm saying that these are some of the uh, uh, reasons why we needed to have. Um, um, a scheme of um, or to have the, an agreement of um, this nature would also then bring the question that what approach are we then going to adopt to intellectual property rights in case um, the actual negotiations are commencing? Okay, Peter, I will, I will, I'm not saying I just want to take you up on it on um, part of uh, what you just just uh, you know the approach um, at the the last, um, the last time we had a meeting where we said so this was, he talked about the need to partner with the private sector. And in fact, said we were going to have a meeting with the private sector and he was moving to see if he would even do one in Nigeria as a way. So, so specific to this sector we're talking about, um, I get plans to engage the private sector on issues around intellectual property, property um, and then specifically to the, um, to the sector. Um, thank you very much. Um, yes, so His Excellency, the Secretary of uh, has always made a point that implementing the AFCFJ is going to be difficult. Um, no two ways about that. Uh, it, it, it will be, it will be um, difficult. So it was for that reason why this always made a point that we need to partner with the private sector to move this process forward. Indeed, um, for those of us that were privileged to have been in the negotiations, um, you know what happened in the specific case of, um, um, case of um, Nigeria. Um, way back in 2018, what um, happened was that Nigeria 
chain the negotiation process. So Nigeria was the chair of um, the negotiating forum. So basically, what the 55 countries need to negotiate. Nigeria again was the chair of the committee of senior grade officials like the permanent secretaries where you meet. And Nigeria again was the chair of the African Ministers of Trade, um, um, the late uh, uh, Ambassador uh, Chief Rosaki, um, chair the senior trade officials and the, 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 the negotiating forum. What then happened was that even though Nigeria led us to conclude the negotiations in March 2018, Nigeria could not stand in that way. And the major reason was because of the push by the by the private sector. And then I recall what then had to happen since uh, uh, zones were created where um, sensitization then had to take place. The point I'm demonstrating here that the private sector is key um, in all of this when we come to um, not just global but all the SCSD, but in particular the VIP uh, it was for this reason that his Excellency, the Secretary General, has always made a point that for him, he wants to have a, an industrial development program. He wants to have an, a private sector unit within the ASTFP that can then push um, forward um, all, 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 all of this. Um, back to the other point I was, uh, I was, uh, I was making. Like, if you're looking at even the approach, the approach will also come. With a number of um, steps. So, first, what we are currently doing, for example, is that we are undertaking situational analysis of what is happening across the continent. So, one of course is also coming to Nigeria to understand what are the IP issues um, that can be taken within the context of the negotiations on the um, intellectual property rights. That situational analysis is having a number of stakeholders. So, um, and then he's speaking to you to make time and then you come into the academics with us of time. And then he's speaking to practitioners as well, just to understand um, um, what's um, what, um, what happening on, um, on the field. So once we have that, we can then decide on which approach we want to use. And there are a number of approaches you can use. If you go to the Indian community, for example, they have an approach. And the approach is to have substantive laws to have IP administration and, and the enforcement as well. Um, in Africa, a number of um, countries have also adopted um, a similar, a similar um, um, approach. If you go to ASEAN, their approach also is slightly um, different. So the point is that there are different approaches we can learn from some, like for example, the ASEAN approach creates policy space for the countries to be able to maneuver um, they are with the Indian, uh, Indian community that doesn't create that policy space. So the approach we may be having, and of course, I'm speaking from the perspective of the of the of the secretary, but this is a negotiation of the uh, countries. So the countries of the country have a All right. Thank you so much. I mean some of your thoughts have uh, triggered um, triggered more because I want to ask like a question, um, or at least for you to share his perspective. Um, some of your thoughts or what you shared that uh, triggered uh, a bit around the research and uh, applying it um, some centuries back. I mean, it's not like I'm that old, it's quite a long time. Yeah. Uh, well, I was part of the Ubude um, Foundation. Um, Coordinating and, and setting up a um, couple of things, and I went to a couple of people like my old mother and I got to assist to see what we do. Um, research and archiving and having a research is what you need to be your uh, challenge. So uh, that is why um, sometimes when we do art um, or films, you know, sometimes you see some kind of like, you know, around what things is um, because of the, the death um, in research and understanding that space. Um, what do you think? Because I know that there's the knowledge research, and what, what are they doing, and how do you think that can be of Yes, you're, you're quite right. As, as um, was pointed out earlier, the Contribution to culture that the films make is the key one. But then you will see that a lot of times 
there is a bit of a lack of knowledge in terms of the knowledge of the past and that brings up that point of keeping new records and so on and unfortunately many of the early films that have been produced here and other things have been lost because precisely of this uh, lack of uh, a due regard for history so it is certainly something that's very important the, the need to archive material the need to have spaces where people can go and acquire this knowledge of things that have happened in the past, the build on the past. As they say, you you, you really cannot, you really will not know where you're going to that the way you've been. And that's one of the things that yes, as you have pointed out, we have tried to in the Noble Studies Center, which is a unit of the School of Media and Communication of our university, trying to create an archive where uh, these films yes will be will be stored. But then you see that the key problem that anybody who tries something like this will encounter is out of funding. Okay? Especially in a space where people really do not appreciate the great impact that these things have, the great uh, impact of the great universities in general. So this tends to be the piece of the problem that those who have tried to go into archive, who have tried to really do things in this space, this is what holds back this process. So yes, there is a need for academy. There are various efforts in this field. I guess that we at the Nobel Studies Center have, are trying to build something like that for films. There are other places as well that have done this. The government has uh, three or four archives in country, but then it's still the same problem that due care, much has been lost because the proper structures have not been put in place. Sorry, I'll let you jump in. Do you, are you working with a company? How, how are these, how is that actually happening? Well, right now, this is part of why I said the, the, the obstacle of lack of funding, that was the last one. So far, it's one of the things we have not been able to fully achieve yet. That is the ideal, to be able to do that. So that you see, it's not only to get the films, it's also how you store them. So certainly, the work that, that's the goal, but this requires the support of the wider community. And that's it's part of the challenge for people to see the importance of this and want to come in. Okay, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this at the time to be able to do a whole load of conversation around it because it is really, really, really important. But well, overall, um, I think I should be just speaking to anyone on all this. The whole bit about you know the ecosystem and uh, building the right skill sets. Um, how do you think that the private sector um, could um, work um, to, or really all the stakeholders that can help build up this skill set for the system? Um, with the skill set, I think, as um, the earlier speaker from the session said, creative arts are started from a very young age in, in other societies, and I don't know necessarily just the US, there's a lot of encouragement for for children to not be anything beyond being a lawyer and engineer, right, from, from when they grow up. But I think that this mentality is changing in Nigeria now, or in Africa in general. It's changing from even looking at the whiz kid to the, the music industry has really paved the way of setting the creative sector as a profession which one should aspire to right from the very so I think mindset starts from giving the creative industry the necessary respect that it deserves. Um, we need to take it seriously as a serious contributor to the economy. So when someone tells you they want to be a singer or they want to be a writer, um, to encourage that part, the curriculum in the university is like, um, the prof I said now there's a learning center in the university, an African studies, there's media there as well. So it's being taken seriously, not just from a primary school level, but also as tertiary level as well. We are making sure that people get that skill set. And of course, there are tons of trainings which people can do. Now everything is online. Right? So um, you do that work at Microsoft, like I said, you can find everything on YouTube. So um, there is really no excuse for you not to find. Um, training, but some of it as well is people being aware of these opportunities. Um, there's, there's a 
there's a thing I always see on Instagram called Skillshare and masterclasses where uh, people who are veterans in the industry uh, you pay a small amount of money and not necessarily small, but you pay in and you participate in masterclasses online. Uh, but then also that comes into the challenge of what governments do to enable foreign payment policies because some of these classes are important. And your Naira card cannot go beyond $100. So you've already cut people off from receiving training. If the training is $150 and it's already $100 short, you come back and because you can only really use $100. So there's so many implications to the policies that government makes. Um, once more, coming back to the financial sector with hundred dollar limit of things, when we talk about archiving things um, using technology, a lot of this is simple plug and play when pay for to use a database, be it one, be it um, our own Microsoft database, be it the Google database, be it Apple. But you need to use a card to pay to be able to save your data on the cloud. If there are restrictions to that, it doesn't matter how many archives you have, you cannot upload them, you can't pay for them. So there are various things that come into play um, as well. I think I'm trying to think there's there's so many, there's so many things. Um, marketing and VR is very important. Um, I know people think VR is more about people blowing their horn, but I think the success of a lot of our movies internationally comes from the way we market and public relations. Um, from personal experience, one of the ways that our movies did exceptionally well is we work with an international film firm in Canada. Um, we do have PR in Nigeria, but it's not focused on the creative sector. It's more corporate. And that is a skill set that needs to be built. There's a way to sell a film. There's a way to tell the story to the media about a movie, which is not the same as when you're telling the story of uh, Microsoft or an American Business Council or IBM. Um, that skill set needs to be built here. The industry needs to have the muscle to also liaise with international trade publications. A film is only as good as the audience that it receives. We have some stellar films which have been made here which don't receive the right amount of publicity. We're not as good to do a film. You need to have the budget, but you also need to identify the right partner to work with. Distribution is another chain which we need to work on. We have a couple of cinemas um, in Nigeria. But it's certainly not, certainly not enough, so that needs a lot of investment as well. So it's not necessarily just the job of the government, but not every time tech. I see this working in the tech industry, but I know that tech is currently as I say, and that's where all the money is coming from. But I think if we encourage people to invest in other sectors, investors are scared in the creative industry because there's no data and they don't necessarily know how they make their money back. But sometimes you have to take a chance and we need to encourage people to, to participate in that in order for us to set up more cinemas, um, more aggregators. And aggregators are the third party that go to one in Netflix or in Amazon who help you broker an agreement. Um, sometimes the streaming studios do not like to talk to film producers directly because sometimes the films are maybe a bit smaller than they would expect and it's easier to go to an aggregator who will acquire your content. But there needs to be knowledge as well for the industry for people to understand how do you approach these people? Who are these people? What is the percentage you should be applying with them for the negotiations? A lot of these things I had to learn um, on my own. And um, so I would like for other people not to have to go through the hard path. For there to be a central way for people to learn these things, anyone can be a filmmaker. We have tons of people who are out of university and are looking for this. You can literally start by taking a course on YouTube, watching, and then just finding out all this information. But they need to be a repository of can learn without having to lose somebody. And that's what other, other economies do better than us. Anyone can be anything without knowing anything. But in Nigeria, 
if you don't know a big time food producer, you might not have an idea of how to get there. It's a general statement because tons of people have I really made nothing, something out of nothing. But we can do a whole lot better to improve this value chain from a legal perspective as well. The partners that you have here, uh, Luca Chambers, uh, our lawyers, I work with them. And I remember when Ms. Yola started, she was probably one of the main ones who was pioneering this field. But we need more lawyers who are invested in entertainment law, in creative sector, who actually understand it, who know how to negotiate those contracts with the big internationals that are coming in. Because the internationals are looking at Africa. They want our content. But if we don't have the right structure and the right value chain in place, we will lose out the way we lost out in our hearts as well. And then participation, especially with the FCT and with the rest of the continent. Not every time the rest. How do we participate with Africa? One of the biggest film festivals in Africa is uh, Vespaco, which is done in Burkina Faso. And um, it is a very reputable film festival with your film shows there. It's a very prestigious. But we should have more of these festivals spread out, of course, and more participation. More, there's another big fair which is done in South Africa as well, where it's the creative market is where people go to buy and sell films. We need more of these spread out, of course. We need more people to be aware of to participate in them. Let me talk. Yeah, thank you so much, Rini. Thanks, Molly. I, I, I would um, go to uh, Jamie. Uh, and so I, I, I recall that um, the, what the webinar we had last year with the Deputy Assistant Secretary, um, um, there was the uh, discussion around possibilities of supporting or partnering with the FCFTA to, to accelerate growth in different um, sectors. And, you know, obviously one of that is, um, is the creative. Uh, a cultural sector. So, so how do you think um, you can run this and what are the uh, possibilities available? Sure. Thank you for that question. Um, I mean, the Biden-Harris administration enthusiastically supports uh, the negotiations surrounding the Continental Free Trade Agreement. Um, the U.S. government sees the value in a negotiation that will promise to connect 1.3 billion Africans and uh, into a market of three trillion and lift 30 million people out of extreme poverty by 2035. And so the administration is ready to partner with uh, with different stakeholders, whether it's at the national level or through the regional economic communities or with the secretariat directly to provide the technical assistance to harness these economic gains. Um, we are prepared to uh, support the negotiations that are currently underway with respect to competition policy and IP and trade and digital services. And the point is to engage our partners so that um, these negotiations uh, provide the IP protection um, that not only ensure that these negotiations and what comes out of them are things that don't disadvantage U.S. companies, but also incentivize investment from the U.S. that can help these creative industries thrive. Thank, thank you very much, Jamie. I'm looking at the time and I'm wondering because there are loads of things we need to talk about. I, but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if we still have all that time because we have um, just about four minutes. So what I'm going to do is to run through like one minute or so each of the last four minutes of this day. Um, so we have the other seven for the seven um, <laughs> to kind of share one single thought around how do we really move forward and what are the next steps that we should be taking? Because I worry about a lot of talking there. So um, so you say kind of talk and then what next? So I'm hoping that we're able to really aggregate or monetize these thoughts in a way that will make sense um, in being able to, to see some clear um, uh, structure in the, in, in the space. So the numbers that I know, let, let's tell you about this, and then we'll move up to four. Okay, well, I will, I will latch onto something that really is said, which is the skill sets and the need for silver and the need for putting the structures in place. 
So truly, that is something that is key because the need to build is not, we focus a lot on people who are core creatives, but also we need to focus on those who are the, who will handle the business aspect, who will deal with the structures. And what we are trying to do in, in, in my university is precisely this, to target many of these core skills. Uh, well, if we're talking about the digital space, okay, we have a program for that. We recently started a master's in film production and things like this. And then even at the top of the government, I know that they are working now to bring up the syllabus on the on film production at the bachelor's level. Okay, so things like this are the core, I mean concrete things which are being put in place, really focus on the on the skill sets and then also the build capacity, which I think is an essential aspect before we can grow this industry. Thank you, Mike. And I think but I, I'll end my more with throwing a challenge in this since we don't want it just to talk. Um, I think that you have such a rich network of American business councils, and yes, one looking at you too, across Africa. So I think there's a great way which we can do capacity building by connecting with all the different ABCs across Africa and creating a forum where we can aggregate creatives and create some sort of exchange program where ideas can be shared, where partnerships can be built, where you can help with those conversations between governments to allow them to shoot in different countries so that you can get waivers for them for not just tax from financial perspectives, then they can get grants as well to be able to have a Nigerian filmmaker shoot in Senegal, facilitated by the American Business Council, the same way to have somebody from Senegal come to Nigeria, the same way you provide a doorway to the industry by introducing them to the relevant industry so they can find players to participate in this cultural exchange. I know that we lay a lot of emphasis in working with America and France, but we have a lot of good culture, we have a lot of good partnerships which we can pursue and which our currency will allow more easily. And I think that that's something that um, the American Business Council, in partnership with all of us here, can try to find ways to work on. And we can get government support in these inter-African inter inter partnerships and correspondences. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rimi. I just mentioned that the American Business Council, in conjunction with um, the Vietnam uh, in South Africa and then in Kenya, are looking at the collaboration around the area of intellectual property. Now, the interesting thing is when we talk about intellectual property, we're looking at other areas, but um, honestly, the issue around the creative kind of went. Um, uh, behind the, the, the back seat or right under the, under the seat. Inside. So this is, um, we're, we're going to, uh, I mean, this is a, a, a record call to get that back on, on track and then get them to feel, get all states to that in the discussion, but the plan is we then engage ESCF, but then that discussion is out. So it's a good thing in each other. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Yeah, for this for the transfer. Um, yeah, so um, in terms of uh, my my last book, I think I have a very number of things I want to say, but um, I'll do it within um, the the one minute. Time. And the first thing to note is that the AFCFTA agreement um, creates um, rights and obligations for only. Um, I mean, the, 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 the state party. So, to the extent that you are not a state party, then um, the rights and obligations um, um, uh, um, are not there. So, this also then brings to mind the question you um, asked earlier in terms of the private sector. So, because it creates obligations for the state parties, um, which is the government, uh, most likely we will forget um, the private sector uh, or we may not carry them along. In all of this, and that was demonstrated when we were doing the the the, um, the, 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 the negotiation. But the private sector is key. You have a situation where, for example, in the negotiations, um, the negotiations are led by um, chief trade negotiators. So you have a chief trade negotiator who is coming from the federal ministry of trade. You know, you can't expect him to know 
everything about the IP issues and the different components, copyrights, patents, and then the other and then the other aspects, which is why when they are coming to the negotiating um, table, you need to also come with some of the content the, 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 the private sector. So in terms of <coughs> the next steps, <coughs> sorry, in terms of the next steps and then what we what we need to do. Um, the first thing I would say um, we should do is um, basically this, that Nigeria or where we are currently, we need to have a, a position on ID issues. So, for example, we are coming to the negotiating table, what's Nigeria's position in terms of IP in the context of the negotiation on, on, on IP negotiation? I'm also saying this, bearing in mind that um, sometimes when we organize one of the commission, we organize a meeting um, on intellectual property rights to develop a regional position on IP issues to go into the AOCFC negotiation. And what we're going to do that meeting, bearing in mind what happened in the phase one negotiations where the private sector said they were not like in, uh, they were not like in four. Kind of what we then said was that for this particular meeting, we are inviting not only the two trade negotiators, but we're also inviting somebody from the IT area. But when we invited somebody from the IT area, it was the Nigeria Copyright uh, Commission that came. But IT goes beyond that. So, which is also the other thing that may also affect the sector in terms of the negotiations. Um, for example, uh, trading goods, and then we are negotiating the tariff, um, 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 the schedule of tariff concessions. If you mention trading goods, what comes to mind is MAN, the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. What comes to mind is Laxima. If you mention IP, what comes to mind? There are so many. Okay, sorry. So there are so many, uh, so many of them. So we need. Uh, that's a coalition that can come together and then uh, uh, present the, the, the IPs together. Uh, uh, point we mentioned was a no, 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 I'm sorry to cut you short, but it looks like there are some people in the audience that are thinking. So, that, what you're going to see may answer their yeah, question. Um, so, do we have those questions? <laughs> Anyone with questions to ask? Thank you very much. Okay, so um, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so we 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 that one, and I also agree with the capacity bill. That's also um, that's also very key. Yeah, so do that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Peter. Jamie, your last uh, thoughts. Sure. Um, I just basically want to say that the United States will continue to do what we have yeah, always done. Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Looks like Can you hear me? But, uh, shall we have to take the comments later or kind of put them there when we're putting our proceedings of this? And I would really like to thank everyone um, uh, for listening. Thinking that the culture, our culture is not about starting a business with staff, and I think we're going to try to find it in ourselves of that. I thank you for the fantastic um, contributions and thoughts and insights shared there. Um, looks like, Jamie, are you back? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Your last thoughts, quickly, because I was just about to round up. Sure. <laughs> yes. That's just quickly, um, just that the United States will continue to engage in the way that we have always engaged uh, across the continent and here in Nigeria at various levels with technical assistance, with providing uh, connections between our private sector to various uh, entities here on the country. And just we all we ask is that, you know, of course, there's so much happening here is just to make sure that we have a story to tell. And so we're always available and open to collaborate and to stay in touch. And we look forward to participating in different forms like this into working with the American Business Council in the future for, for different events on the creative economy. So thank you for the invitation. 
Thank you very much, Damian. I'm looking forward to further work as Emia discussed at some point. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have some more to take uh, Remedy, I think uh, Jamie, a uh, very fantastic, great discussion, and I'm looking forward to um, putting this together and having some clear, actionable um, outcomes for this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, goes straight into the next panel, moderated by Isio Maike. Um, we'll use 40 minutes to, or less than, to um, have the discussions. So the panel topic is Position Nigeria's Creative Sector in the Global Space. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning. My sorry, apologies for my voice. I've been speaking all week at different events. Um, and so, unfortunately, my voice has, has gone this morning. Uh, my name is Isioma Ibibe, and I'm a senior associate and the head of media and entertainment law at Pinoka Attorneys and Solicitors, which is a law firm here in Nigeria. Um, today's panel that I will be moderating is titled Positioning Nigeria's Creative Sector in the Global Space. And to have this discuss with me this morning would be Mr. J.D. Martins of Comic Republic. Please a round of applause for him as he comes to the stage. Mr. Stella okay, um, from Stunt Group UK, leading um, talent management company in the country and actually globally. Please give him a round of applause as he comes up to the stage. All right, thank you, Fela and GK, who I happen to, well, Fela, I've known for a while, and GK, I've, I've known you by reputation. So I'm very ple pleased to have this discussion. And I don't think there are any two individuals that are better pleased to actually engage in this conversation, which is such a contemporary issue for the Nigerian creative industries right now. You know, everyone knows that Netflix has been acquiring a lot of content. Fela is part of um, the Afri Film Festival, which is going on concurrently right now. And Amazon was one of the sponsors and sent a huge delegation in here. GDA is signed to CAA, which is like the biggest, you know, talent management com uh, company in the world. And I'm sure you're having very interesting conversations. So, I say all this, oh, sorry, Tanya. Tanya here. I'm so sorry. Hi, Tanya. Tanya is joining us virtually. Thank you so much, Tanya. Tanya is the US attache for economic, economic attache. For oh, IP. Sorry, Tanya, I'm so sorry. Um, Correct. Um, so I don't think there could have been a better couple of people to have this conversation. So I'll go straight into the questions. Um, yeah, I have them on my phone. So I my phone, I'm not trying to do it. OK. So I, and, and how I like to run my panels is once in a while, I'll have a question that is specific to one person. But in general, I always just like to throw out the question and have everyone give their perspectives on it. Because I mean, in putting the panels together, I'm considered you know, that everyone came from different aspects on the topic that we're trying to discuss. So 
when they answer the questions, they will answer from this perspective. So I'll start with you, Judy, and then after Judy, Fela will go and Tanya will, will run it that way. In, in your opinion, you know, and in everyone's opinion, how has Nigeria's creative industries fared globally? Oh, that's, that's a tough one. Um, so far, so good. It's not good globally, uh, but recently it's been good enough. Um, you know, in the sense that if you look at, for example, in terms of my field, for example, the manga industry is raising close to four billion dollars in revenue. And you can't say that for Nigerian farmers. And you know, by the time you speak to, even if I speak to people who are in you ask how many Nigerian farmers you know, they will be doing them. If you want to bring up how much we make in revenue, Right, we can't even say it's close to one million dollars compared to Manga in Japan that we really have to do in the rest of the world. I, I, I don't even want to go into what the Western country industry is good, you know. And you know, looking at the artistic industry also, we still are very stereotyped thinking for the thing that you know, when we talk about the artistic industry, we are just you know, looking at general art itself. Or just moving it. The world has gone so far in the creative space. We are now in the realm of fantasy, but there's so many other things in between. So I wouldn't say that we're doing well at all, but the good thing is that there's an awakening and it's happening here. Um, good morning, everybody. Excuse my voice. This is my setup in the middle of that world. It's worth the end of that world. And I'm the project director for that. Um, uh, I appreciate the opportunity, so I'm always happy to speak. But, you know, success is relative, right? Um, you know, what are we doing in the grand scheme of things? I think, you know, I have a, I came, I came from a music background in terms of um, managing talent and like global partnerships. So, if you look at what we were doing in music, probably just 11 years ago, when we launched Spill It in Nigeria, Africa's first streaming platform to what's going on in music now. What always happens on the continent is we're always ahead of the curve. Um, and Spill It back then was competing with iTunes, but we, do, we didn't have the, I guess, um, foresight maybe, and we were um, a little bit. Uh, like I said, I had the curve and we didn't have the patience is what I was looking for to keep going. Because if you look at what the fintech guys are doing now and how fintech is pretty much the talk of the town, the creative industries has the same opportunity. But what's lacking here is cohesion. Right? There's a lack of togetherness in this, and that you need that to do anything global. You know, we get excited when Netflix want to come and they came and they had a, a little pocket. But ask yourselves, did they really meet the game changers, the tastemakers, the true tastemakers, the real tastemakers, the people who need access? You know, CAA are here, don't ask you. They global agency is great. Um, I don't people like to really uh, assign to those kind of agencies. But that's a very small drop in the ocean of what's necessary. You know, we need a big, bigger, better collective to make a bigger band over there. However, being accepted by the West, it's not the be it and end all. The creative opportunity on this continent, in Nigeria alone, is huge. Nollywood still churns out 20,000 films a month or whatever it is. And Nollywood has continued to evolve. You know, you see that out. I'm not here to plug that phrase, but we receive 4,000 submissions for films. We have, we have to narrow that down to 133 screenings in a week. This year was the first year we received more Nigerian films 
you know, that is not this. You know, we get films from all over. It's like, it just kind of tells you how we evolve as a creative ecosystem. And, you know, I had an opportunity to join the big agencies. I've always refused to. I've always decided to do my own thing. I've always been focused. 70% of my work is focused on the country. Um, <clears throat> and to answer the question, there's, there's no real answer to the question, but it's a great question. I, I think it's a question that everybody has to have in the back of their mind when they're trying to build a creative business. So it's how, it's not just about, you know, if we're making the right impact on a global scale. It's more about how we're going to do that together. You know, Amazon were here, and, you know, I remember being at a networking event, and I stood back, and the people there, Probably 70% of the people there are not the right people who are going to be making, who are really going to be making an impact. 65 million of our population are below the age of 25. A lot of those kids are throwing out content just on a daily basis between themselves, amongst their friends, but they don't have the access. They can't access the Amazon and Netflix. And so what happens is, over the next five years, the same filmmakers, the same content producers will be the ones that will be getting access. So what I implore all of you, including myself, is to dig deeper and find the those, like I think these boys from Kaduna were signed to CAA as well, Godi Korodu boys, those kind of kids. It's all about access and cohesion. And once we answer those two questions, we, this, the West will be coming to us. Because when they come, we dance to their gene. And in my opinion, that's not where we need to be right now. Because we have all the creativity in this country and on the continent to make. Thank you so much, fella. Tanya, and just sorry, before Tanya, before, before you uh, give us your spin on the question, just wanted to let everyone know and uh, thank you. We have Adele Awofisayo from YouTube joining us. Thank you so much, um, Adele. And um, just so you you know can tackle the question, the question which we are all taking you know is is with that right now is how has the Nigerian creative industry fared globally? So Tanya, over to you for your perspective. And after that, Adele, you can go ahead and give your own response to that question. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And first of all, thank you for inviting me to participate on this panel. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you. Next thing, actually, I am not an economic attache. I am a prosecutor from the US Department of Justice. And later on, that will become apparent when I discuss some other issues. In terms of how Nigerian creative is faring globally, uh, it seems to me that it is a work in progress. It is growing from the time I first reached post in October of 17 to now. And I base that on seeing more and more Nigerian books, more and more Nigerian films on airplanes, et cetera. Now, I think that, um, as I said, it, it's, it's still somewhat embryonic. The speaker before me, uh, talked about uh, the togetherness as, uh, as necessary and the lack of togetherness as part of the impediment. And I can see where Nigeria at, in its embryonic stage now could benefit more from a unified approach to IP enforcement. And I think that that's something that could help the tremendous creativity coming out of Nigeria to become a greater global force. When I see some Nigerian, for example, writers going into the United States because there may be stronger intellectual property protections there, that is something that's coming from Nigeria, but it could be stronger if they could do these things from Nigeria. So um, I, I think that it is faring, it, it is faring well, but it can do uh, so much better with all the creative talent and power here in Nigeria. Thank you so much, Ayan. Apologies again for 
getting your room mixed up. Um, sorry, I, I, I it was an honest mistake. So, Ali, okay. uh, <laughs> what's your spin on it, on this question? Uh, sure, and good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. It's it's a bit odd when I'm on Zoom and everyone's in person. I wish I was in person with everyone, but thank you for having me on this panel. Um, I think, I mean, working at YouTube, I see the amount of creativity coming out of Nigeria and just Africa as a whole from our creators, right? From people who have a phone and have something um, to share, whether it's a talent or it's a story or it's a comic skit. And what is super amazing about, I think, you know, our creativity coming out of Nigeria is that we have the diaspora. And so they connect to that creativity. I would use an example, you know, Mark Angel Comedy, who's the biggest creator on YouTube in Africa, it has over 7 million subscribers. And Mark's most popular country in terms of his views is India. And the second one is the US, right? Before Nigeria, Nigeria is the third. And Mark is a creator who started in Portakot, right? And so for him to be able to reach an audience as far as India, and he, he even said, Adi, like, I've never been, I'd never been to India and I was wondering why Indians were consuming my content, but he had so much fans that they invited him to India. So I think we, I think our diaspora helps because there are, there's probably a Nigerian in, in every, every corner of, of the world. And those Nigerians are sharing the content that's coming out of the country. And it's, it's, the stories um, and our and our jokes are connecting with people outside of, of the country and outside of the continent. So I think we're definitely seeing um, Nigerian creativity exporting um, to a global audience. Thank you so much, Adi. So my next question, um, in listening to what everyone has been saying, we, we keep coming up, you know, mentioning about three sectors. Nollywood, music, and books. But we all here know that the creative industry is full of a wide range of subsectors. So, you know, I want to know from, and I know, Jide, this is a, a big point for you specifically. What are the challenges for the other subsectors of the Nigerian creative industry when you're looking at the global market? And why do we think, panelists, that you know, there seems to be all this attention on these three major, uh, you know, these three other, I don't even want to use the word major because I do that feeds into that narrative, right? These other subsectors, and we're not seeing the same kind of energy for, you know, the other sectors within the creative industry value chain in Nigeria. Do you think? Thank you very much. Um, so, in answering that question, I'm going to address the core thing, the problem with the other. Sectors, I don't like the term set, yeah, set or major, and you know, you're feeling so a bit enough, right? Um, and you know, piggybacking on the previous panelists, right? The first thing is, we keep thinking that as an industry, that uh, we need to be local. That's the first mistake, right? As creators, we're very passionate, right? And because we're passionate, we try to make everything resonate to us, you know, it's always about a global collective. I personally think that, you know, for us to just fix that problem, we need to understand that the world in general has become a global village. And that in anything that has to do with business, especially if it has gone beyond being a passion project, the numbers matter, right? Um, you put four or five countries together, you can't compare the numbers to that one country. And so if you focus on our goals in everything that we're doing, that we need to see, even if it's a cultural basis, the global market, that is when it becomes a business worth investing in. So that's the first thing, right? We want to build capacity in our own digital community, but we need to understand that we're building capacity for an audience that is no longer local. If you are making content, you must understand that you are competing against the YouTubers from around the world, you are competing against Netflix, you are competing against Amazon, you are competing against. That is the 
with Nigerian analysis. And so when you're building your capacity, you need to start thinking about how those audience are building for not just global capacity. You can actually build local content for an international audience. And there are standards to quality. And I think that's where we need to start from. We need to build capacity. We need to become professional creatives, not just creatives anymore. We need to understand that we, it doesn't matter if the target, the fact if a movie, a comic, music is only as good as its audience. If your audience doesn't like, no matter how passionate it is, no matter how cool it is, as a creative interface, it will not work. So if we start to look at that, it becomes better. So that's number one. We need to use capacity for me within. Second thing to tackle that is how do you use capacity? I'm going to take the analogy of a football team. Right. Nigeria's football team does not only consist of people staying in Nigeria. Most of our football teams are players who have gone around the world and have played in different countries, have acquired knowledge from different countries and different places, and have come together to make a team. Our basketball team has been part of America and not from the world. And mostly people from outside the country, right? As individuals, we need to first build capacity on our own. I see a lot of creative players looking for help when they have not formed their skills themselves. They've not tried to acquire best standard practice in what they do, and hence they want to lean on other people and other things before they go. Imagine if we have five, ten, fifteen professionals in the room that we have in our building capacity. So as individuals on our own, I believe we should first start to look on my own. Can I defend? Can I produce stuff with any of my counterparts anywhere else in the world, not just my dear? Even if I'm creating the beginning map, my sculpture, if I'm drawing a comic, if I'm making me, can anybody else? I mean, I'm mostly in the UK, and you're going to the UK club now. Why people don't think my dear me all over? That is a testament to the level of skill that I'm using to make it, right? So even if we're going to, you know, view capacity individually, we need to get better, and then we'll have a stronger collective all together. And then in that regard, also, why are we so adverse with working with international community? Like, as my brother said, yeah, he's organizing Africa. I came into the country for Africa simply because Amazon asked me to come. CAA tried to sign the contract because of Brazil at the point of COVID. This is simply because of the quality of our work. And the reason why I was able to attend that work, I was in the meeting with Amazon yesterday, so that and I can go on the meeting meetings of week is because I have an intent of CAA. Again, it's the good audience. YouTube wasn't able to make it. YouTube is the platform that goes global. And like the lady said, the guy's biggest fans are in India, not even Nigeria, right? We need to understand again that we're a global community and we need to collaborate with the global audience to produce local content suited for the global community, of which Nigeria is a part of that global community. Very important. And then when we start to look at that, we now start to look at creative products that for the global community. Again, it's just we moved away from you have to be a lawyer and advocate and that. So now you have to be a musician, you have to do traditional art. Or you have to ask them when there's a bigger community, the gaming and animation industry worldwide is making a revenue of over 400 billion dollars. What are we talking about? The movie industry in Nigeria cannot step up with the animation industry in the US. Why are we so focused on the movie industry at all? Why are we not providing infrastructure, specialty, or technicalities for the animation and animation industry? Marvel Studios, and I'm sure everybody here knows Marvel Studios. There's a studio based on comic characters. Personally, we just finished the project for Facebook. We fought for CNN. We fought for BBC. We're presently doing stuff for DW. We're doing stuff for loads of American companies. What do we do? We make comics, right? And we're paying taxes in Nigeria. Imagine if we have more studio teams, this other thing, well, the actors and the movies are their own. We will constantly contribute to the of this country. We have a lot of young people who don't have the experience, the facilities to act. But guess what? They're creative. Who enjoy gaming? Who enjoy comic books? Who enjoy art and stuff like that? 
anybody here will be like, you want to get something, somebody to make something for us, and you want to crack them young, the best thing is to crack them at their fashion. So you have loads of kids reading manga, loads of kids playing games, loads of kids watching animation, and you're not tapping that passion, that creativity. And the population of the kids, the young people in this country, go two to one. I'm using plain terms so people can understand what I'm saying. And yet we're not investing, we're waiting for an industry that is dominated by the older class, the acting industry, the, the guys who are really making it. And there are twenties and above. What happens to our strongest population, the young people? Why are we not tapping into that? Right? And then again, I think we want to bring government policy. Right? Because for example, you can't pay for instance. One of the reasons why I want to pay for UK is that for things we need to pay for, you can't pay for them. Data storage, for example, you could be followed on this. Nigeria only allows this brand to be on their balance. You know there is no that makes sense. Right? So you have to be outside on it when you build pay for stuff that you need for your business. How do you do that? To pay for courses online, you can't pay. The late for me, um, Microsoft was you know, really hit on those points. So government really needs to help to put infrastructure for us. You, you know, Nigerians are just the place where we're not waiting for government anymore. And I'll tell you that it doesn't make sense to do government anymore. If we really want to progress in investment of government policy, government policy, if they are not going to invest, and people like myself, people like Africa, are bringing resources and paying tax to the country, why put policies to end us from helping ourselves individually? They need to start putting policies that allow us to be able to cooperate with it or to collaborate with it now, the international community, where there is a market where we can provide numbers that will further down the line bring investment and yet and increase the GDP of the country. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, thanks. Um, so I'm going to ask you. Well, I think historically, the reason why music only would, I guess, I was that. An art. I've always been a huge focus. And it's just a historical thing in Nigeria. On the music side, you know, even uh, back when Sonia Day, Fela, they both perform at the Hollywood Bowl, they perform at Coachella and places like that. So, uh, and the record labels have all been here in the 70s before. So, music grew quickly because it was something that was known to anybody who wanted to get into it. And, and, and Nollywood, because of just the sheer amount, the sheer volume, um, and the, I guess, um, the marketing that Halaba did back then, that you know movies became a, a focal point for these kids to get into. And then the work that Iroko TV and people like that started to do. Um, you know, that's one reason. The second reason is there's a lack of um, tertiary institutions specifically for the creative arts, uh, the creative industries in Nigeria. You know, um, I, I live between the US and the UK. And, you know, if you're an actor, if you're a photographer, if you're a model, if you're an artist, there's a place for you to go and get trained. Right, without having to go to college, I don't have to go to USC or, or a specific creative university. In the UK now, you have a specific, uh, there's the University of Creative Arts in London now. We don't have those tertiary institutions. If my nephew wants to become an actor, I struggle in Nigeria to find where he's going to go and study. There's a couple of institutions, the Proto Academy is trying, Tell York is trying, um, uh, Every Life is, tr is trying. And in fact, there's a few, but you need more. You need a place where it doesn't have to be uh, a long winded course. You know, I may, you know, somebody may just want to hone their skills. You know, there's a plethora of acting classes in the States, in the UK in France and places like that, that an actor can tap into on a weekly basis without having to sign up for a year. So we need to look at that. Um, 
But most importantly, I think in order to spread, and you know, you've got to look at the work that Artex uh, and you know the film festivals are trying to do, Lagos Photo Week is trying to do, um, to spread this message that the creative um, industry is beyond just music, Nollywood, et cetera, et cetera. And then also, when you go behind the scenes of the creative industry, I think these kids need to understand that there's so much more of a career um, behind the camera. You don't always, everyone I meet, especially before I sold my agency in Hollywood, everyone I've met in Nigeria, always approach me to be front of camera. And I don't, you know, I, I get it. This is a very aspirational society and everybody thinks they're a star. But you always have to be very honest. As an agent, I'm very, very direct to these kids. I took, uh, I spoke to the acting class at AFRIF a couple of days ago. There's 30 kids in there. And I said, if you're lucky, if you're lucky, between two and five of you will make it. And that's the truth. And then one day, I'll tell you, in Hollywood, on any given day, there's 200,000 200, actors. I think it's about 300,000 actors auditioning for 500 roles. And that's just generic, not to talk about those represented by agencies like CAA. I'm not even talking about the top five agencies and who they represent and the fact that the, 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 uh, the casting director has already got a short list. Right? But if you go behind the camera, the roles are huge. And that's what we need to put forward. My second to last point on this is at AFRIF this year, we decided to um, launch an esports and animation. My new agency is focused very much on sports and entertainment, but our focus is because it has changed in the sense that the sports and entertainment world are becoming one. And when I talk about entertainment and films, the esports and animation are the future of the film world. That's why Netflix bought a gaming company. That's why Amazon bought Twitch. So I think, and, and I think they had the animation gaming there on Wednesday. And every night we have a party after it. On Wednesday night, I did a party for these kids at Beirut, and 500 of them showed up. They all showed up to the esports game. And it, it showed me that there's a, an underbelly that's bubbling in that gaming and esports and animation. And that's, that's very necessary. And that's happening. But we need to make it happen more. My last one is, in order to stop the uh, proliferation of everybody wanting to be film or music and not relying on, on government, we're working with, there's, there's an opportunity to create creative clusters across Nigeria. For the photographer who lives, I don't know, on the mainland, in the Keja, when you create a, when you have a creative cluster within a, uh, an environment, you're no longer having to think, I need to get to Koyi, I need to be on the island to be successful. Um, India did it, did it very well uh, in terms of how the creative industries ex exploded with Bollywood, but even with Bollywood now, Bollywood has spread across India. Right. The creative clusters is very important. What YouTube and the light allow is for that to happen on your mobile. This is a mobile first market. Yeah, yeah. And anything anybody does should be focused on that. Yeah. And if we focus on that, that's the way we can really spread um, the industry being better focused, but less focused on just music and film. Thank you so much, Fella. So, um, Tanya, this question is to you. Um, from your perspective as a prosecutor and also as a U.S. citizen, and everyone here knows 
I mean, when it comes to the creative industry, it doesn't get bigger than the US. You know, that's the market to aspire to. So what are the key ingredients in your opinion? Again, from your perspective as an IP prosecutor, to make a country's creative industry a global force to be recognized. Thank you, uh, Isioma, for the, for the question. And I'm going to articulate three factors that I think have helped the U.S. to become the global powerhouse that it is. I think education and awareness, and the last gentleman spoke about, and I think Jamie also spoke about the various arenas for education, for creative education, as well as awareness building. I've even read like random novels where a character created a a sauce and recognized that there was value in that intellectual property in the sauce. So education and awareness building would be the first. The second, I would say, the strong, dependable laws that the creatives recognize are there and that they can expect to be enforced. And the third would be coordination. And uh, so, Isio, when I corrected you about being a, a prosecutor, it wasn't to embarrass you, but that was in part to talk about the coordination. Um, because I work for the US Department of Justice and we work on enforcing the criminal violations of intellectual property laws. There are IP attaches who are deployed worldwide who come out of the Department of Commerce. And uh, that was just sort of to illustrate that the different agencies do work together and coordinate in working to um, strengthen IP enforcement globally to benefit our partners in the, on, the, on the globe, as well as US businesses. There is an intellectual property coordinator office, intellectual property enforcement coordinator, that's the, the title. And this position is in the US White House. And many other agencies that are involved in intellectual property protection do annual reports for the IPEC. And that would be from the Department of Justice, the Department of Commerce, the Department of Homeland Security, because under that section, there is an intellectual property um, coordinator and many other agencies work with them. And we've actually been working with Nigeria to try to create uh, something similar. But that sort of coordination is very, very important. From the, at the Department of Justice annually, we have meetings with a number of agencies for whom intellectual property is an important part of their, their work, uh, the Motion Picture Association and some of the others. In fact, I like to talk about a very early case when I was a young prosecutor involving movies that were being reproduced Way back in the olden days, someone would have a big room with these large uh, VHS machines, creating them with the shrink wrap and doing all that. And I worked very closely with the investigator from the Motion Picture Association that that case even made it into our office for prosecution is one sign of the coordination between um, the private sector and the enforcement agencies. I talked about the education and the awareness building. Within the Department of Justice on its public facing site, you can find a guide for victims of, or people who suspect that they are victims of intellectual property crime with a, a step-by-step -step set of um, suggestions that they would want to do to help preserve the evidence. And that kind of education. In um, the USPTO and the Copyright Office, they have sections on their public facing websites to give education about protecting the intellectual property rights. Um, and so that sort of education and awareness building, the sort of, of coordination and the strong dependable laws that I mentioned before. You know, the gentleman earlier, he made a, a statement about um, something being acceptable to the whites for intellectual property protection. I love to give the example of Tyler Perry. Tyler Perry's work was not widely accepted by many whites. However, he was able to uh, use his intellectual property rights with his Medea character and with all of his other work. And um, he worked with other 
intellectual property experts who would help him to develop his property. He has one of the largest um, studios there in Atlanta. He has been able to build a billion dollar business with his own intellectual property, not worrying about not having gotten a seat at the table. He built his own dining room with his intellectual property. Um, and now that is something that is being deployed um, or being shown globally. So I would say that those factors, the education and the awareness building, the strong coordination interagency, as well as working closely with the private sector and strong, dependable uh, IP laws. Those are some of the factors, I think, that have really helped the United States become the global IP powerhouse uh, that it is. Thank you so much, Tanya, for that very detailed um, response to the question. Um, so I'll go to you, Adi. Um, how do you think creatives can access the global market? And I mean, from a YouTube perspective, what is YouTube doing to facilitate this? Yeah, and I think um, I missed, I think it's Baba. I'm, I'm not sure the second uh, man that spoke. Fella, fella. Fella, okay, yeah. He, um, he actually touched on this when he talked about YouTube and just the global reach that we have in our platform and it's not just youtube like it's other platforms like netflix like amazon like TikTok, a lot of social media platforms and i think that's the benefit that a lot of creators have today you know in before the youtubes of this world you probably will be trying to get your movie on ait or silverbird or you know and then they'll even be telling you to come and buy airtime right they won't want to buy um, your movie, the, you know, you have to go buy airtime to put it on. But today, a lot of the creators can create their own movie and put or create their own, own series or content and put it on YouTube for free and be able to monetize that and reach a global audience. And, you know, I like giving examples to just make it real and not and make it real in our market, because a lot of times people think, oh, it's, you know, it's only in the US or it's only in the UK that these things happen. But we're seeing a lot of creators in, in Nigeria, in Africa, who are taking advantage of whether it's YouTube or TikTok or, or Netflix and pushing out their content. So one example is um, Neptune Three Studios, the three sisters who went to school in America, went to film school, came back, um, had a did a short movie and they were basically looking for where to house it. They were looking for a distribution uh, platform and they went to different TV networks to try and put it on, but they were asking them to buy airtime and they didn't. They were like, well, we've invested the money in actually producing the show. We don't want to, you know, we don't have money to invest again to find a distribution platform. And they decided to open a YouTube channel and upload the, it was a 30 minute video and upload it. And within, I think about two weeks, they got almost uh, 500,000 views. And a lot of people asking for, because people thought it was a series, so they were asking for the next episode. And from there, they decided to create a series out of it because they didn't even, they didn't know that there was an audience and a large audience that was craving for the kind of story and the type of content that they had to share. And today they have over, I think, 700,000 subscribers. They've created four seasons in that series. They have people in Nigeria, outside of Nigeria, who are watching it. So I think a lot of creators today are definitely not doing the, the um the old way of, of pushing out their content, right? They're not waiting on uh, an AIT or even an Africa magic to, to put them on. They're looking at, you know, whether it's YouTube or TikTok free platforms that they can push out, get a global audience. Um, and I think um, Tanya, you know, um, using Tyler Perry as an example, it's also about knowing your audience and knowing what they want. Your content is not going to appeal to everyone and you shouldn't even try to appeal to everyone. Try and find your niche and then target them with the content that you have. And once you target, whether your niche is young people or it's people in the diaspora, I know creators who are like, no, my, my audience is the diaspora. I'm targeting 
Nigerians there. One, because I get to monetize better because the advertising revenue is better um, internationally. And that's, you know, they create content that's catered for that audience. Um, and people in Nigeria may not necessarily watch the audience. And there are other people that are like, my audience is Nigerians. And so they cater um, their content to, to the Nigerian audience. Thank you so much, Adi. Um, do we have any questions either from those online or in the audience? We have about three minutes to take any questions. Yes, please. Oh, yes, um, I didn't think so because we influence the mountain. I come into public with our stories, we did that here to stop our own 90% of the time and become rich more people. As long as we start to tell stories or we're communicating messages that directly affect the lives of people, right? Target the institutions. Like I said, we just finished a comic book for Facebook that deals with misinformation, which is a major issue digitally right now. And because our platform is strong and digital, we're able to spread presently, I think we'll hit um, close to like 1.5 million people who have seen us directly targeting why we shouldn't spread this information that affects things like people's health and scandal of people's images and stuff like that. So, yes, the, um, the creative agency actively plays, you know, on the role of software. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's not much else to say. I think it's been obvious. We've seen it happen about a year ago and with the, the part the creative guys, especially the skip makers on YouTube playing and getting the message uh, about Insult out there. India used this very well in terms of, you know, enabling people to get their messaging out. The creative industry has always been the channel uh, for messaging to get to people. Like I said earlier, it's all about accessibility, um, information, and you know, ignoring sensibilities because through the creative industries, if I'm making a film, if I'm reading a book, um, if I'm writing a song about something that's deeply in, you know, uh, um, affecting the, a country or whatever, I can put that out through those channels and, and the message uh, gets across. Well, I also do this new film, Collision Course, that, that's premiering tonight, tells that story of Ensign very, very well. Tells the story of the police officer and the young musician and how their lives intertwine. So, definitely the great industries can be. Uh, a, a strong advocate for uh, soft, soft power. Tanya and Adi, do you want to take a swing at that question? <laughs> you know, I think the earlier two speakers have completely, um, they, they have said it all. I don't think that I really need to add very much. And I think the, the gentleman with the glasses, is that Baba Agba? Um, <laughs> just... They do look alike, but it's not Baba Agba. <laughs> it's Bella, Bella, okay. Oh, okay, okay, because I, I, when he says anything, I pretty much am nodding my head in agreement. <laughs> so. um, Abby, any, any input? No, I mean, I think, yeah, like Tanya said, I think they said it, they said it also, um, basically just reiterating and plus one to, I think, what they said. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone who has stayed both online and in person with us on this panel. I hope you found it informative and useful and hopefully we'll take these conversations and actually make them a reality. Thank you to the American Business Council also for coordinating this event with Buruka and Ohanini Law. And uh, we look forward to doing this again next year. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the panelists as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Shema. Thank you, fellow. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Judy. 
um, for the last panel, for the last panel, um, which will be moderated by um, Tiwe Ohanili. Um, hi, Tiwe. And we'll have, um, we'll have Mr. Aditi Efjong, the CEO of Anaco, um, Mr. Jidi Martins as well, then um, Kumi of Game Evo, and then Murawa Ayagili. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, any TFL? Kumi, are you online? Yes, I'm here. Uh, I'm almost done. Okay, fantastic. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, very excited for this particular panel, uh, primarily uh, because uh, we've heard a lot from the stakeholders um, discussing high level uh, you know, concepts and topics, but I think it's always good to get to the ground level, to get to the actual individuals who are doing the work. Um, and one of the reasons why it's vital to have these conversations is because their perspective is one that um, can't really be replicated. They know what it means to be creative business owners on a day-to-day -day basis, especially in Nigeria. Um, so um, th this, this panel I'm, I'm incredibly excited uh, about. Um, so I wanna just jump right in and start with uh, Editi. Um, I've watched Up North. I had the privilege of watching the short film that you uh, presented at the panel, uh, at the uh, US uh, counterfeit um, uh, conference that happened in, I believe, 2019. And, you know, having the kind of experience that you have as a filmmaker, um, I'm curious what your perspective is on the impact that streaming platforms are having on uh, Nigerian content creators, especially given um, you know, the fact that they are of course looking at a global ecosystem, but what happens to the local stories that need to be told? So um, Editi, I, I'd, I'd love to hear um, your thoughts on that. Okay, that's a really big question. <laughs> um, I'm gonna to try to break it down on uh, my immediate answer would be that stories are stories. It doesn't matter where stories come from. Stories are stories and stories are universal. And, and more often than not, it's the uh, media and distribution that, that decides whether a story is a big story or a small story or just a story that we, we, I mean, I was talking to a friend recently about all the folk tales that my grandmother and my mother used to tell when we were young. And the truth is, there's no difference between the, uh, the Greek mythology and ethnic mythology that I grew up on. And the difference, obviously, is that the Greek mythology is told in Hollywood, and mine is either not told or, you know, when, when someone is a witch, is, is a bad person that must be prayed against. Whereas Harry Potter is a billion dollar, most billion dollar franchise. Stories are stories. It's, it depends what we want to do with the story. Now, on the impact of streaming platforms, I, it's very important to, to welcome growth in an industry. I used to tell a friend of mine, Naz, and also who I owe most of my film career to, that there is a, um, there is a train coming. We're either going to build the train tracks or allow people to build the tracks for us. And so shortly after that conversation, Netflix had its first event in Nigeria. That's part of that train track we're talking about. And, and Netflix has allowed like, the rest of the world to see a lot of Nigerian content in, in the way that they would not have seen it. Um, Off North was one of, the, um, one of those I think 2018, which was a breakthrough year, I think, for Hollywood. And, 
and up north, King of Boys, uh, Chief Daddy, a bunch of Nigerian stories went on Netflix and they, was, they performed spectacularly. Uh, this tells us that there is room for growth for Nigerian stories, obviously, and we just need a better distribution. And so there's, there's that. And, and so these platforms, Amazon is here, um, Netflix is there, there's YouTube as well. And all the platforms, they are allowing us to see a different perspective, see different opportunities. Um, from a very personal perspective, I, I think for Anacle Films, we are set up to, to do things a bit differently. We are focused on telling what we say is the next generation of African stories that I told for a world class audience, I think. And it means that the stories would have to be a bit bigger in terms of scale, um, and which is what we, my first film being up north. Um, say an example, we had to, I was talking to, we were trying to recruit an actor. He read the script and got to the place where we, we said the attended in Daba, and he says, I served in Bauchi. I know what the Daba looks like. I do not see how he can replicate that. And so he didn't want to disgrace his family, so he didn't do the picture. <laughs> and so it was very important for us in, in creating that story to, to go ahead and, and make the Daba as big as it could possibly be, because that is, we can't just, you know, in telling stories, we have to represent our cultures, our stories properly. I think it would be a disservice to try to tell a story of a northern Daba and have five people on the street right now. You know, so it's important to be trying to show what our stories are, to, to show them properly. And so that's what we do. And, and this streaming platform is actually helping in terms of, you know, giving us a market that is, is bigger than, say, because there's only 60 something uh, screens in Nigeria um, for cinema. And so it limits the amount of investment that can go into storytelling. Um, an example is that in my, I, I just finished a film called The Black Book, and I wrote a market scene, Balogo Market. And my editor was like, Guy, you've come again with this thing. Balogo Market required to have three, 400 extras in, and test them for COVID in North COVID shooting mm -hmm. earlier in the year. And, and, then, and then just having building a market set. We ended up building 38 sets in studio, out of studio, to make the story very authentic. But, and that ultimately raised about a million dollars to do this project. We would not have been able to do that three years ago. You know, we would not have been able to take such, uh, make such investments. We uh, we just uh, started raising, actually we closed about 40% of the $10 million to tell stories out of Nigeria because storytelling is expensive. We couldn't possibly do that if there were no emerging markets and new markets and platforms to take the stories that we take. Because to tell the stories in the way we need to tell them, you're going to need bigger platforms that can return investments. So yeah, um, we're grateful for the opportunities for those platforms. And yeah, I'll, you'll mind. Thank you. I think that was um, a, a very nuanced uh, response to my question. Thank you for taking a swing at, uh, you know, the big question. I want to pivot really quickly to talk to Murewa and Jide again about storytelling because you use a different medium, um, you know, with uh, the uh, universe that Comics Republic has built, right? Um, that's largely part of the reason why CAA came knocking at your door, uh, the incredible storytelling that you guys have been doing for quite some time. Um, and I'm actually quite a fan of um, Murawa's uh, webtoon. Uh, my grandfather was, uh, was a god. And what's interesting about both of you and both of your companies is that you have a digital approach to a historically paper-driven industry. And I, I wanna hear a little bit about why the two of you decided to go digital and why um, and, and what impact that has on your ability to tell such unique and specifically African stories. So either one of you can, can start off. So thank you very much. Um, when I started Comic Republic, which is literally eight years ago, 
uh, digital platforms weren't really a thing. Uh, but for me, you know, I, I, I was looking at it from a business perspective, and I didn't just want to create stories that people would see. I was very um, fan driven. And so I felt, okay, for us to make content, I needed to deliver it to people quickly. And um, at that was the time when, we, um, let me put it this way, we started leaving Blackberries and, you know, um, digital mobile was becoming a thing and everything was going online. So it just was a natural progression. And to be honest, when I started, you know, I had even people in the industry telling me that that was crazy. It wasn't going to work. Um, it was, I just, it was just logical. It was a logical thing to do. And you know, thankfully today, that is the trend of the comic industry as it is. We led the way of digital comics at the time when all the comics were playing. And because of that, we've been able to reach loads of people. You know, we are obviously doing 1.5 million views a month now. And we never would have been able to do that if we were, paper is bulky, it's hard to distribute. And we're in a country like Nigeria where there is no infrastructure. Even if you wanted to build the infrastructure, the roads would kill your mode of transportation and distribution. So it's just, I think it, to you know, wrap it up, it was necessity. And um, I would say, in hindsight, strategic thinking on you know, what the future of media distribution was. And you paid off. Uh, thank you. Um, I live outside Lagos in two states, which makes access to books, especially when it comes to um, fiction books like uh, novels, uh, craft novels, comic books, very, very uh, difficult. So uh, I do want uh, people like myself that grew up uh, outside of. Uh, urban centers to have the kind of childhood or experiences I had. Um, getting your fix of fiction is kind of um, very, very difficult. So the accessibility was a major concern. Um, how do I get um, our stories to people outside the um, urban areas to get access to the stories? And um, before we started the series, my grandfather was the god. Um, we did a comic book series with um, action and entertainment, um, new men. Uh, we're also trying to create a series where our growing families outside the country and our growing families inside the country to have um, a, a product where they can both consume easily. Uh, another thing we also noticed we down um, for some time on digital comics and the, real, the format of the comic book page itself is more suitable for paper but you could also read it on a laptop on the wider screen. But also because a lot of our readers were mostly on their mobile phones. So we went with the webtoons vertical scroll format to make this more accessible. Uh, not everybody has um, a laptop or a wide screen, especially we're focusing on um, readers outside the urban areas, but they do have the smartphones. So we went more with uh, the formats that is easier to access, easier to read. So basically it's more about uh, accessibility and also about comfort. Um, as much as we cherish this industry that we work uh, in, it's, it's, it's an industry that it's, it's not food, it's not water. So to some extent, you need to be able to make it uh, easily accessible. It shouldn't be something that I have to, has to be expensive to get. It's, 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 it's a comfort even though it's something that reaches our very soul. We still, we still need to make it very, very easy to access. And that's why we're also, just like Comic Republic, we, even though it's digital, we also try to make it free. They can do to access it for free. What I really appreciate about both of your comments is you have a very intimate understanding of your customer's experience, right? At the end of the day, 
um, even in some of the comments that EDT was making, right? You you're aware of your local limitations and you you work around them. You you find avenues to navigate, navigate. you know, the realities yeah. of Nigeria. Um, and I think that the digital aspect, right, has become um, one of the ways that you can circumvent some of the gaps in the values in the value chain in the infrastructure. Um, the internet has really helped a lot of creatives um, get around what you what used to be real challenges. Um, and with that uh, understanding about digital, right, the the way that the internet has sort of democratized access, I want to jump really quickly to gaming. Um, one thing that I find really interesting about Nigerian creatives is they're really passionate, and they're passionate in a way that I mean culturally maybe we don't have any business being that passionate about the creative sector because we've all heard the stories about being unserious, you know, the, the comic industry, what, what is that? You know, you wanna be a filmmaker, maybe at one time that wasn't something that people necessarily encouraged. Now, you know, we've heard a lot about gaming and esports even during this session alone. But when you talk about access, right, you talk about um, you know, developing an ecosystem, especially with gaming and esports. Um, I'd like to bring Kunli in of uh, Gamer and Niger Game Evo to kind of talk about how you develop an ecosystem with within the gaming sector, knowing that honestly, esports is kind of there's a lot of infrastructure challenges to put it to put it lightly. So uh, Kunmi, we'd we'd love to hear uh, your thoughts um, around how you're getting around that from um, you know business standpoint, a capacity standpoint, infrastructure standpoint. Uh, thank you, Chinwe. I'm really glad to be here. Hi, everyone. Uh, so basically, from from this end, it's it's not been easy. 14 years into the ecosystem of esports in Nigeria, and um, it looked like we haven't even scratched the top of it yet, because most of the times we 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 hit gridlocks because number one, the culture is not there. Um, okay, no, let, don't let me say the culture is not there. The culture is there, but the infrastructure is not there. Government is not helping. Um, I remember when we were growing up, um, we used to have a lot of our kids. Um, here and there, but um, because they didn't understand what it was, they thought it was gambling, and they, they put gaming under the gambling ecosystem. So it now became a problem for game centers to run. They started having issues with police, uh, police coming to bust them that they were gambling and all. So that had to shut down a couple of uh, years ago until we revamped it and said, okay, uh, we're not gamblers. We're gaming where um, another ecosystem in the creative uh, industry that can be flourished. So we, we had to cut on it and yet they were able to remove us from the gambling ecosystem. And we were able to stand alone and say, okay, we're, uh, we're in the creative industry. So looking at how we built gaming in the past decade, it's not been easy because uh, getting sponsorship for events, um, getting to even tell people that I'm a game, I play video games for a living or I create tournaments for a living. Uh, like you said, most of them think, oh, okay, yeah, we are not serious. <laughs> but what we've been able to do is listen to, not listen, not adopt the Western world and be able to show people here and tell them, see, there's a career path for everybody in gaming. And it's not just, gaming is just, a, a, a particle from a bigger ecosystem, which is animation, comics, and all, because most of these games come from stories from comics. Most of these games come from uh, stories from animation, and even games have been translated into comics and animation. So it's a whole industry in, in it. So uh, we have, we formed Gamer not, um, not long ago to bridge this gap between gamers, between the corporate industry, even the government, so that they can all come to under one platform. What exactly is this gaming and esports that you people are talking about? We've been able to give them stories of uh, one of our players that is now a PSG coach just from gaming. He now coaches in France. 
he left Nigeria to South Africa as an esports player. Then he got um, called to France to to start um, coaching esports players. We have stories of people that are earning up to five million naira per year right now in Nigeria from esports. So those are the things we're now showing them and say, okay, this particular set of people are actually creative. A lot of things they do will impact the future of other people out there that, that the society is looking at them as um, people that are not serious. We are going to create that career path for animators, for gamers, game developers, um, shoutcasters, because that's another um, industry again that is, is popping up. So it's, the ecosystem is so big that I don't even know it. I've been in the business for 14 years and I can't even tell you because a lot of things start popping up every day. Now recently, there's a platform called Discord. Discord is the home for gamers right now. Although it wasn't really built for gaming, but 90% of gaming goes there. It's a social media world for for gamers. Now we have what they call the moderators. The mods on, on Discord alone get paid to mod. So that's another job right there that we, we just discovered. Right now, today we're having an event and we have mods coming all the way from Portacot and Ibadan to come and mod our live events in Lagos. We haven't met them before, but we've been working with them, paying salary for one year. Now we're meeting them for the first time today. So those are stories we would love to share to the general public so they will know that gaming is as big as it is. Like Mr. Gide said earlier on, 400 billion. What are we talking about? And Nigeria has not even started hitting 1 million. That is in esports. But we have a consuming factor that takes over $100 million a year in Nigeria. 2016, Nigeria brought in gaming revenue 181 million. 2017, 161 million. But it kept dropping because there is no esports. People play games, people embrace games, but there is no esports ecosystem to even um, survive game developers. So we are at a stagnant position of 100 million. Whether you like it or not, 100 million is still a big thing, but there is nothing being done about it to actually create that industry for, for gamers. So Lagos State has embraced esports now. Game developers are going to be um, doing a lot in 2020, in 2022. So uh, we're, we're happy that is happening. So throughout the years, uh, the ecosystem, building the ecosystem has been hard, but yeah, we thank God where we are right now. And um, uh, for people like you that give us the opportunity to even speak, we thank you. So yeah, that, that is where we are in esports in Nigeria right now. Well, I mean, again, I think your story, like uh, Murewa Editi Jide, is one of you know a, a business owner who is in the creative space who understands that perseverance and you know the long game is the way to break through. The unfortunate thing is not everyone has the endurance, not everyone has the access, not everyone has the resources. Um, and one of the things I really want you all to sort of talk about um, are some of the challenges in terms of, you know, the infrastructure. Everyone has said infrastructure, but we know that the, you know, the creative sector, even though it's all coming from creativity, something that people are creating from nothing, film and TV infrastructure is different from esports and gaming infrastructure is different from comic books, um, animation infrastructure, right? So I'd love to take it back to Aditi. Um, and can you talk to us a little bit about some of the challenges from your perspective, um, whether it's capacity building, whether it's training, sourcing talent, or even behind the scenes, right? The people who are helping you close these deals, you, you're talking about raising funds in, in you know, millions of dollars, where's the support? right, to sort of facilitate those things. Because we know when you talk about the US, it's a full ecosystem, including ancillary professionals, not just the people who are creating, you know, the creative work. So talk to us a little bit about um, what that experience is like and, and what are those challenges for you and your industry? 
Okay, once again, you ask a really large question. <laughs> so I'm going to try to break it down from, I think there's, there's problems that need to be solved in terms of um, production capacity. Uh, there's uh, problems that need to be solved in funding. There's problems that need to be solved in infrastructure. And then of course, access. Um, I'm going to start with access. Nigeria is a very complicated country. If a few days on Monday, um, I had to work, as of Monday, I had to work three days in the Marina CMS area. We had to shut down the, the highway, park the highway to, to shoot a scene from, from the film we we're, we're currently making. And we are done with the main scene and I'm shooting at a nice big church in the area. So I I, I leave to the next scene to shoot the next scene. We've been here for three days. And so the drone team uh, had to do an establishment shot, so they had to stay back. I'm here 30 minutes later, I get called, oh, um, the, the, the team has been arrested by the Navy and they have been taken to the barrack in, uh, in Ababa. And I'm like, no, oh, this is not happening. And I, I have to make calls to the uh, defense agency. HQ in Abuja, um, work the phone lines and, and work all kinds of other contacts to get them out. This is standard practice. This is, this is anyone who's making fear in Nigeria. Um, the guys who make milkmaid spend time in, in, in military cells, you know, because the military came up and they built like a really fantastic. Uh, camp, which is what production design does. Production design is supposed to design sets that look real and so design a, a camp that looked really real, but then there was government officials and permissions to do that. But the military arrested them, spent time in, 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 uh, in, uh, on the arrest. Trip to come and attack someone, so we 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 got a nice visit. Meanwhile, we had to apply for permission to do all of this stuff, and so to do these things, to do these things at this scale requires like a lot of access, and and there's only very few people who have this access. <laughs> you know, if you do not have someone to follow up your letter, I'd say a DHQ, your letter will be there for a year, man. <laughs> You know, so uh, these are the problems that need to be dealt with centrally. If if the government does have a clearing house, or if you want to make a film and you want to show the police, you just submit your script, submit your treatment, and, and get approvals. It would make things much easier. But now everyone just has to find their connects to do things. It's it's not efficient. It does not encourage growth. It does not encourage investment. And, and so that's it for access, for, for training people to be able to, to do things at a certain scale. Um, I am actually, I speak from a place of privilege. I always admit that um, I come from a very humble background, but I've been lucky to have grown through, through um, privilege, the privilege of, say, I worked in the oil industry and was exposed to a lot of high level logistics. I worked in uh, product management. I, it allowed me to see how managing products and getting access to brands. I work in advertising. I work in tech, and tech is where I learned to raise money. Advertising is where you know advertising operates at a very high level, and so these experiences have helped me as a filmmaker. You know, making things at scale to to approach things a different way, and it gives me access. But now I, I'm doing a film where I need to, I'm shooting at Takwa Bay, I'm doing a night scene at Takwa Bay, and so I have to light it. It's, filmmaking is logistics. <laughs> it's logistics. And, and so I have to, I have to like um, get a generator that can power the big lights. You're going to light a night scene film. 
you have to power very, very powerful. And so it's more generator can because there's no mains power. In fact, you can't even plug film lights in mains power, even if you did have mains power. So we had to get like a 50 to 100 kVA generator to talk about the how do you do that? In my head, as a guy who used to be in the oil industry, it's simple, just get a batch, put a truck in it. But we are in Nollywood, people don't do things like that. You know, it's not a common thing, it's not a thing that people get to see being done. So um, I say, okay, we get a barge and put the truck on, I will be fine. And I am back to doing my work, only to realize that the team who were responsible for that do not have the foggiest idea, like, how do I get a barge? Where do I get a barge from? And so you're always having to come back and sit and walk people through hand holding. There's a lot of hand holding when they produce the scale or having to do the logistics of building the markets or logistics, the logistics of building traffic or getting a highway shut down for you to work in or building a pastry or building a cell, or, you know, it's, so there needs to be a lot of training, but training is, can only take you so far. If you sit in the room and we tell you that we can do this or this can be done or the circumstances that require you or that it's actually cheaper for you to build your market set than actually shoot in the market. You know, so you have to have big pictures exist in the industry for people to actually work and learn on the job. It's the only way. You know, the, the team that actually did the data day when we we're doing up north are very competent now at doing high crowd scenes. You when you shoot with 25,000 people on set, you nothing phases you, nothing, nothing would shake you again. I mean, so I think that there needs to be more big picture story industry for people to, to actually work and learn because it's really the only way. Um, no one teaches you how to deal with area boys. There's no school, film school, that teaches you how to deal with area boys. What I do when I get on set, the first thing is identify the leader of the area boys, make friends, we sit now, eat together, you know, talk, go ahead, share experiences. I'm always telling area boys, look, I, I come from a town in Calabasa, you know, and Calabasa is in the Niger Delta and stuff. People don't greet people and say good morning. You know? When I meet a guy, area boy from my area, good morning, I slapped you already as a greeting, you know, so that if you slap you as a greeting, what would he do when you're fighting? And, <laughs> you know, no one teaches you a thing in film school like, you know, I met an area boy who settled all the other guys and he, he shows up and says, no one settled him, he's going to scatter this place and turns around looks at me and says, I will slap you. So I turn around and slap him really quick. <laughs> and uh, he's like, he's looking around and hoping like he can have back of him. He settled everybody else and he comes to me, why do you slap me? He says, I'm from the Niger Delta. You know, you don't threaten to slap me. First, you slap me. I will decide to slap you back. But if you say I will slap you, you already slap me, so I slap you back. <laughs> you know, and and he's looking at me. This yellow boy, you know, Lagos guy, that he actually had to that is to slap me. You know? So I asked what it is, man. Look, slap back. He couldn't. And so by the end of the day, we're friends. But no one teaches you how to deal with that situation in film school. So we just need opportunity for people to work, opportunities to, for people to actually see things being done, opportunities to people being smart and sense of your <laughs> So um, I, I think, I hope I've answered some of the question. Um, it was a really big question. So this, this is something that takes a day to talk about. Like there, there's a lot of learning that needs to happen in the industry. And for that to happen, we need bigger projects. And for bigger projects to exist, there needs to be that you know, funding for that to, be, to happen. To apply for permits, we spent a year pre-producing a picture. To do that, it takes money. It takes money to buy patients. It takes money to buy time. And to, to be able to do that, to put an actor to train for six months to get into a, an ideal shape for a picture, it takes money, it takes patience. You know, and so it's a, it's a, it's, it's a big, complicated conversation that needs to be had around funding, and, and, and training and just more experience opportunities for people to have more experience, which is why I think one of the most important things like I have been able to do in my productions is always have a team of young creatives who are just there as interns to just learn. You know, they don't have, they have responsibility, they are assigned to different departments, and, but what they're really there to do is learn. Thank you.
Thank you for, again, taking a stab at a big question. Um, moving on to, you know, Jide and Murewa, I, I want to tweak it just a little bit um, because we were talking about, you know, the infrastructure and the capacity and all of that. But Jide, especially because you have now taken stories that were for um, this local community and you've now really taken it to a very global level. I, I'd love to hear sort of how you grew the team that you eventually were able to make that transition with. Because I imagine the operations initially, you know, creating the comics, publishing it is one thing, but then actually taking the next step, you know, having these meetings with CAA, having these meetings with Amazon, like that's a whole different ecosystem and it's different. So I'd love to hear about that journey. Um, and then for Murawa, yeah, definitely talk about um, your, uh, you know, challenges, especially understanding, you know, your, your um, perspective being outside of the urban center. So uh, just to tweak it, you know, more to your specific businesses. Thank you very much. Um, so the first challenge that we had in our field was a mind frame. You know, uh, this mind frame that we have in Nigeria, and I would say most of the African world, that if you're not in any of the major profession, which is if you're not a doctor, you're not an architect, you're not a lawyer, you're not a model, and even now, if you're not in music or film, um, you can't make it big. And that was one of the first things that we needed to tackle, you know, was to change the mind frame that this is actually a profession, uh, a profession that you could actually make a living from. And, you know, and, and I would start with here, for example. So I'll just give you a bit of our track record and I'll go to, you know, some of how we take it. Comic Public as a company alone. Um, just from investment, meaning people who are brought into the company so far, we've been able to raise over $200,000 um, as just investment. And this is not investment that we needed to pay back. This is we have um, a member of our board from the UK, we have a member of our board from the US, we have one from India, and we have one from I think Cairo. Um, but aside from that, we've been able to work with major international corporations. CW, which is Dolcella, we're working for BBC, we're working for Al Jazeera, recently started getting stuff for Facebook. And like yesterday, I had been to Amazon where we're discussing in hybrid, somehow they will acquire a whole catalog. And I have a team where we pay salary, they have our own pay story building, where we have staff and capacity of almost 200 people all together on top of our contracts, artists, and our internal in staff. This is not minus in the fact that we have our own digital platform where we publish our work worldwide. And aside from that, we pay people's salary monthly without fail. People are actually making a living from making comments. Now, if we're able to change the mind frame on, people know that, look, you don't have to. Fortunately for me, and I'm really glad that I don't have to start by um, Right. And there are a lot of people who don't have that kind of energy or experience, but lots of young, talented people, photographers, artists, writers, who just need to sit down in one place and use their creative talents to make money and publish on digital platforms like ours. You understand that there are platforms where all you need to do is to be creative, and that was the first thing in this chain. The second thing was for us to change the perspective that creatives are professional. Creatives somehow feel that they don't have to go through the normal business rules and profession. One of the things that I instituted in coming to public is that look, on Monday, you must wear a suit. On Fridays, you, we are all, yes, one of my staff is here. You can't come to the office shabbily dressed. We have professional protocols. You need to treat it as a business. And like any other business, even if you want to be creative, you have to have a business plan. Like you said, you raised 10 million, or they are 40% close to 10 million dollars, correct? We are we will not be able to get a job with people like Facebook or be able to 
Jude to come, where we're making ten comics or close to a hundred thousand dollars, just making ten comics. If we were not carrying ourselves at the highest professional level, you need to understand the business practices, or we had to understand and train people on how to actually create a business, and that the business requires collaborative work. As an artist, you need somebody who's good in finance, you need somebody who's good in publicity, you need somebody who's good in marketing, you need to use your digital platforms. Most people don't know that you can actually just publish your book on platforms that will actually sell your book for you, and you don't need to need your book. But first, that book needs to meet international standards in terms of proofreading. So we needed to start training people. Fortunately for us, we're able to partner with schools like Pan Atlantic University, where we get interns every year. And we have people who actually go to school, who are studying the cost and media, who come to learn the business of public making and come out as professionals. A core member of our, of the core part of our team as comic book makers is that we have a very strong admin staff. We have eight people who don't do comics, all they do is manage the comic creators. Again, you know, creatives, the moment we're able to train creatives from their professional capacity, we're able to service clients who actually know what they're doing. And then the other thing you need to start convincing creatives is that you need to start creating for yourself, create what is passionate to you, but understand that you're creating a product for an audience. And hence, you start to create things that brands be able to recognize you. This is why Amazon is able to call them for allowing to have these various stakeholders in international. So, you know, again, everything, you know, to what I'm saying is that it starts from the mind frame of understanding that this thing is possible to be there the right way. But a lot of people ask me that what is the Nigerian factor in this, right? The truth is, I keep saying that the world has become a global community and there's so much infrastructure that the world that the world has provided that is not something. A lot of energy and we have this sense where we have to learn stuff from yeah. other people. So the University of Beijing mm -hmm. is coming to public for self taught mm -hmm. and a lot of things you can actually learn by going online or finding mentors. And as people on this panel, we also need to invest a lot. Like you said, I was very happy when you said that we actually ensure that we are interns there. You need to find Either online, you don't need to have a physical mentor. We, you know, I like to tell my people go on YouTube, first do a research, figure out how to do this thing on your own, and they come to us, and then we'll take it from there. So that was the other thing, is that even though we have limitations here, because the world, you need to remember, has become a global village. There are loads of avenues for us to actually learn and acquire skill, because if we don't acquire skill, we can't do business. We cannot attract the people we want to pay for. That needs to be in our head. Depends. If you want somebody to pay a hundred naira for your product, and then you want somebody to pay a million naira for that same product, you understand that the way you present that product and the quality of that product has to be different. And so the moment we are able to go beyond things like worrying about the network, worrying about the internet, right? And we understand that, look, I need to get investment, right? Why do I need to get investment? Because I have to start it in the right? I'm going to need four for the next five years, basis, right? I'm not going to hope and pray that I get the money for four. No, I'm going to create a business plan. I'm going to have my friends and family. I'm going to explain to them how I'm going to make money. As look, you're not going to say, look, guarantee. No, you say, look, if I take, if I make this out, I'm going to take it to this marketplace, and I'm going to sell it on this platform, I'm going to sell it here and there, and I'm going to make five now. And over the period of six months, I'm going to give you two five out of that five now, because I need two five to fulfill myself, and I'll be able to pay you my back. That is a business plan. With that, even people who just believe in your work, you will have the mind of putting um, avenues. So you need to have a business plan, you need to have a product plan, and then you need to have a sales. So those are all the things you needed to put in place to get to where we are. This is a very passionate topic for me, so I can go on my things just for that, and I can have all my other plans. So I'll skip that.
Thank you, Jide. Okay. Um, um, since we work mostly uh, a little comes and we work most outside of the urban areas, uh, the problem is that it takes a bit of awareness. So um, we used to, the industry just to refer to ourselves as we work in the public industry. So we have a problem that people might first assume that um, we are standard from the community, like maybe Dave Chappelle or Bastien Mount. So if you say comic books, to a large extent, they are familiar with uh, Batman and Superman. So they, and, but they're not familiar with books, but they know the characters. So they're assuming you are you producing a superhero movie or a superhero capsule. So um, we get mixed up a lot with and in the animation industry and um, the comic company, stand up company. So, so the awareness is the, the, the problem. But it's not that they're not experienced or they're not aware of the medium itself. The medium itself is quite popular in the country, both in the urban areas and the rural areas. Well, uh, we where people use the medium, we use the medium in newspapers. In newspapers, you have all those cartoons. That's sequential art. That's, 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 that's the comic format itself. You have um, the image and dialogue and things like that. In textbooks, English textbooks, the old ones, we have that format. You have uh, the old Simbi and Ali goes to school and wants to show the differences between our Polish art, our Polish art, and English words for some of those things. They are presented in the comic book format. So we are familiar with comic book formats. When we do get people to try out our product, they don't have problems with it. Yeah, they don't think of the first image of the text. They are aware of they don't even know what it's called. So, so, so market yourself becomes difficult when you don't even know what you are. So that's one of the uh, major challenges that uh, we we'll think with time and perseverance will uh, die down more. And but while we're waiting for that, while we're waiting for the awareness to spread out more into the um, corners of the country and the continent itself. We try as much as possible to try to make money from it, to make money, and without go more with the international market. Because we're a comic book studio, uh, more than a publisher, so we produce comics for other companies. We work with the uh, Mansion Lab, we work with, uh, we're currently working with Scout Comics in the US, uh, we're currently working with Story World in the UK, and uh, we recently just started working with Marvel Comics in the US. And one of the problems we started facing working with them is the government policies. It's government policies. Um, there are no tax treaties. And so it's, it creates um, some issues with our withholding tax, um, some companies don't withhold tax, and so many people would rather not work with you because the stress is just too much. Work with when there are they can work with someone from let's say Canada or the UK to provide the same services with less stress. So you you you're competing almost handicapped because interacting with you alone has become so difficult. You already have things like time difference and uh, things like that already the problem. You don't want the financial part like tax and stuff being an extra problem. Um Getting, we, we discussed about um, the, the, the limits we have when you want to pay for things, but we, we will not discuss the limits we actually have to see that money too. There are, there, are, there are limits on how much dollars you can receive into your account on a monthly basis and things like that. So, so many times you have to receive payments from a friend, a family friend in the UK, then they try to sell it and stuff like that and get it in Naira. It's it's become so cumbersome as if we're money launderers when this is just a crazy industry. So there are lots of complications that come with just doing business with uh, the foreign markets because we look at industries like the manga and the anime industry in Japan. A lot of their markets come from the UK, a lot of their market comes from the US. It's not just locally. We would like to do something like that in Nigeria, where yes, we have a market in Nigeria, but we also want to cater for the market 
uh, the, the foreign markets, the foreign audience, or we keep having issues when it comes to signing someone to these deals and everything. Sometimes um, the publisher wants us to just stop work because they don't want an issue where we completed work and they can't give us the money because that will start becoming a whole legal issue and everything like that. So if if some of these things can be attended to with that kind of help, not just us, but even other people in this growing industry. Because the coming industry is mostly for in Australia. You have all these people working for uh, Marvel, working for DC. The artists themselves are freelance. So it's not it's something that's for Nigerians to get into free work from home and all those things, but you have to make interacting with them easier, interacting with these foreign uh, publishers easier by putting things like all these activities in place and things like that. And I think that's the major problem of this thing currently in our company. So I just, I, I, I want to say, that oh, like Nigerian creators, uh, Nigerian tech guys, Nigerian people generally um, have always had trouble working internationally and, and solve those problems without government intervention. It would be great to have those interventions and stuff, but we, we are all doing business internationally. Currently, he is doing a lot of international business. I'm doing a lot of international business. So I think that um, I like founders talking to founders on founders. It's very important that founders talk to founders because there's solutions to problems that I might have found that would be useful to you. He is found that useful to you. So I think this is a conversation you can have outside. I do not think that, you know, getting paid from the country is a problem at all. It's a <laughs> You know, and there's there's also an example that's potentially, you know, incorporating outside of Nigeria. It's not rocket science, it's not it's actually not, not difficult at all. You know, and so you can you can then be able to receive, you know, payments outside so you're not restricted by say a central bank FX restriction. I mean so there's there's all kinds of solutions and that's just one of them. You know, just that's what I want to say. Um, there's some things that um, I'm looking for the right way to put it. It's what I was saying about we need, as creatives, we need to treat it as a proper business. No shortcuts, right? Um, I do feel, I don't know if that is right, that if you, know, you have all your proper corporate documents and you open a proper corporate account that allows you to see for reference into now and you have to see if we get paid in upwards of hundred thousand plus straight into our Nigerian account. So I think that's what we were worried about because it's being filled. That's number one. Number two is that you know we need to like you said open the company in which is what I also recommend. This is just so that your Naya doesn't get the value as you're getting paid now. Um and the artists also, even though they are freelance artists, have been strict contracted and we have contracted artists that say you can't work with people from certain countries or you can't work with or you work for a certain duration of time. Uh, the biggest problem we have as creators and we've been to that page before is where you know we're not putting all the proper infrastructure that is based on us. I mean, which is why I said that we're an international company where in an international space, one of the things that we've done is that we've opened the PayPal account. Also, even though that is not allowed here, but what could what is possible is that you can actually open a dumb account here, right? A dumb account here in Nigeria where you can receive dollars in that dumb account, and then you get your money in dollars here, and then you have change here. Another thing you can do is you can have somebody just register the company and incorporate it in any other country. And then open a PayPal account for that country. So, you know, um, I feel that if we treat the creative space like a proper business, there's a lot we should be able to do for ourselves. My worry is that reliance on our government to put infrastructure in place is a good to have. It's not going to happen anytime soon. It's going to take 
Thank you very much, Mr. Williams. To us, we need to talk about power issues. So, if we are waiting for government to provide power, it's a project that will not be ready in another ten years plus. Business is not going to wait for you. There are lots of plans. One of the things I really like your your business was that you guys have optimized using web teams perfectly. We have our own platform, um, and then you know one of the things that your platform has that doesn't have is that it's your your community is faster, right? In Community Public, for example, we are very, very you know, interested in building capacity. We want people to be able to stand up their own here and not rely on any other platform. So, in Community Public, we have our own platform, which was built here in Nigeria. Do you understand? That way, we control how we publish, when we publish, and what people can read. So, building independent capacity, but also institutionalizing properly. Um, you know, as a creative, I'll ask you that please go out and look for people who are good at finance, who are good at administrative work, who are good at, um, at institutionalizing, who are good at legal issues, and let them do what they do widely. Um, and, you know, they are the ones that will tell you this is a good marketing strategy, this is not a good marketing strategy, this is target. The target audience, I always tell people that we want to create a comic company that is not Nigeria. But a comic company that happens to be Nigerian. I don't know if that makes sense. Meaning our target audience is not just here, right? It's a global audience, but it's created by Nigerians. And we're feeding Nigerian mouths, even though we're servicing clients abroad. Right? My target So again, stop. I don't want us to think small, but we need to put in the stuff that we can think. That would be nice. So one of one of the things that I'm really happy about that's happening right now is that um, we're actually seeing. I have two questions for Jide and for ADP. So first, hello, my name is Chikima. I work with um, US Commercial Service. So I cover the media and entertainment in, um, sector. So it's been really interesting listening to all of this. So first, you mentioned that. Um, your market is 95% international market. Is there a market for what you're doing in Nigeria? You know, and um, how deeply have you gone into distributing locally? Then I'd also want to ask, I know that you have African characters, but do you tell African stories? Then how have you been able to navigate piracy issues? Then for Editi, two questions. First, how has the pandemic um, affected your business? And then when are we expecting the Black Book? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so to answer the question, I'm going to be typical Nigerian and answer that question. Are we part of the international market? Well, we should be. Yes, we are. When I say I'm, I'm making comics for the international market, that is 100% inclusive Nigeria. Okay. What that means is that my, my product is not targeted to only Nigeria, but targeted to especially Nigeria and the diaspora, right? So I am constantly looking at best practices for an international market of which Nigeria is inclusive, right? Um, and that way I'm able to, again, I talk about about the numbers, right? So while I'm creating a comic about Shungo, right? I'm looking at how did Marvel do Thor. The truth is the Thor that you see in the Marvel Universe is not how the real Thor really is. The real door with two big horns completely shared right on a cow, I think. Right? But that's not the door you see in Marvel, right? There's a universal language to movies, there's a universal language to creative work, there's a universal language to this. And so for me, under that creative and international market is the core focus of put Nigeria's best food forward. Right? So I'm using a particular method that will show the best of our work, but that will be understandable by the international market. So for example, if I create somebody speaking Yoruba, I'm going to put the translation on that where you will understand what the word is in Yoruba. The quality and the colors of the work that we're using will match recognizable quality and creative processes elsewhere. So yes, our market is primarily Nigeria, but we ensure that we create the product by the international market. That's number one. Um, sorry, what's the second question again? How are you navigating piracy issues? Okay, so there are some things that 
even though you protect, you cannot control. Again, I'm providing real life solution, right? One of the reasons why we give our company to free is that best business practices have shown that when you're um, providing things for a huge audience, you cannot afford, you cannot avoid piracy. The truth is the countries with the best piracy laws still have their movies ripped off. Most of the movies you see around were not watching cinema. How do you, how does everybody know every single part of the I can tell you it is impossible for everybody to have one cinema to watch it. Right? So there are, there are piracy laws that are in place here. Nigeria has some of the best paper piracy laws. When I say paper, they can protect your physical food, but they don't protect the physical property. Right? But understand that anything you create physically or digitally will be recreated, whether it's protected or not. So my advice is to start forming a business strategy around the fact that you know that your work will be pirated. Right? So for us, we give our comic books free for how do we monitor it. We sell the numbers. So it is important for me that our platform must have Google Analytics, Facebook Analytics, and any other thing that can measure how many people are looking at them, so that I can sell the fact that I have one of five people reading my comic books every month to Facebook to say, let's create a comic for you, and I can see that it's not all. So, so the only way to avoid parity is like saying that you stop the alarm voice from reading music. No, you release the music on music. Not everybody enjoy it. And then let you go come and how many music or an experience So the way we talk to parity is take cognizance of parity. Understand that it exists. It's a problem we cannot solve and monetize around the fact that it exists. Thank you. Answer all your questions. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. So, filming is like you. I cannot release my film for free. No, I'm not. But seriously, you know, I I think we had the viewers just as part of it, and um, the viewers uh, as a part of collaborate with us to make fish ball, and it was released for free. Uh, it's easy, it's, it's cool. So you should take the change. I'll create a story. Fishbone, I wrote Fishbone in So, <laughs> 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 so <laughs> you know, and so there is that. And that, that works. But I um, yeah, I so you take uh, a 400k investment like uh, of Lord or a million dollar investment like a black book, you can give it up for free. Or a hundred million dollar investment, say the Marvel series, you can give them up for free. So one of the things you try to do is like you you price piracy in and try to ensure that the uh, the investment is recovered quick enough and try to protect the IP as much as possible before it does get pirated because it will. So you are absolutely correct, but I mean, there's a limitation to that in when you, because the film is capital intensive, you, you front load the capital. So you have to protect the IP, you have to take measures yourself to protect the IP before it gets into market. Um, your second question, your, your first question actually to me was about COVID. <laughs> I had COVID in December and, and um, I suffered through it to the end of the year end of the year. On January 2nd, I was on a plane to Kaduna to do a technical review, so I, I was passed, I passed out twice on the set. So I know all about COVID. <laughs> um, but to, to protect the crew, we had a big glare mask policy, we had, a, we had a compliance officer, we had to always wear your mask. Um, every hour of 10 minutes to an hour, they walk through, um, sanitize, and then wash hands. Everyone had to wash hands. They had we had our badges, so the shooting crew had all access. Um, so all the um, team members didn't have all access just to protect people. And it worked really well until we had a new member of crew who just came in, hadn't gone through a proper briefing and had contact with the DOP and a couple of people and those guys got COVID. And so when you have a DOP catch COVID, the AD catches COVID and uh, the uh, assistant producer stuff like that. It just grounds it grounded the production for twelve days, and that's money, right? It's a ton of money just keeping crew isolated in a hotel. You're not shooting, but you're paying 
uh, international reach for cameras that came in from the UK, from Pan and Beach, and you pay for it. You know, so yeah, that did happen. But we tried to try to make sure that when, once we got back to Sydney, we got even stricter. Um, the situation, for example, with the market scene that we did, where you had to have uh, our extras, we had about 300 extras. You have to test everyone for COVID and then isolate them in order because again i was working my lead was rmd richard moffat damager he is 60 years old you're not going to expose him to covid and you cannot you cannot shoot the scene with mass so you have to test 300 people you have to test your leads every week and considering how expensive covid tests are yeah so that's the only way <laughs> That's the only way to protect people on set and protect people. But you have to look at it from two ways. If I do not protect those people, if you don't do this thing, it's more expensive losing time to to it's more that it's too much more expensive to, to ground your production than to actually assign monies for reporting on COVID tests and protecting people. So you do what is a smart thing, smart, expensive thing, but smart thing. Again, it comes back to investments. To do the right thing, to do things properly, requires a lot of investment. And so um, I wish that we had a bigger market than we do. That's why our markets should not, definitely should never as a creative person restrict your market to Nigeria. It's not, it's not a smart thing to do. Now, one of the reasons I did not do it social media said it was radio silence and so I don't know how to answer questions like that. are we getting the right food? It's a, a big it's the biggest film production ever done in the country. It's taken a lot of energy and time and so I'm not going to compromise that by rushing into market and taking the time to make it right. But when you get it you you see that you respect the actually respect the audience you're making this for. And hope that when it does come out, it does what it's supposed to do, and then you would love it. But yes, I think that you would have not definitely show you this platform next year. Thank you. Thank you. Final comment. Please invite us to the screening. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, too. Thank you very much for the support. Do we have another question in the audience? I have a question. I have a question. My name is Jay. I'm um, a partner in Greenport Avenue, the North Ham, and the Vibe Baby Festival. But that's not what I'm talking about. Listening to the um, people speak has been quite um, brilliant. Um, to, to think about the, the, the amount of logistics you have to put into sleep to create um, a film, I'm beginning to wonder, you know, um, would it not be wise? I'm just thinking, you know, to create like a universal studio kind of place somewhere in Nigeria. You know, or maybe like it's William's book kind of place so that you need a particular thing, you know, you know, to find what you're looking for. Any kind of running to be area boy and you know, all of those things. Again, I, I want to think that I mean is an um event investment for that, you know, it could create more opportunities for um for people. And um for conflict, I <laughs> Uh, Republic, sorry, Republic, Republic. Listening to your story, I just imagine what the childhood would have been like, you know, creating comic and Well, I don't know, maybe your parents were um, easy on you, you know, but I'm thinking. I'm just thinking about, you know, your children this day, okay? Um, yes, the world has. Honestly, change where um, we're beginning to realize that okay, if you're a film maker, you know, we're we'll still the time. If maybe you're writing comics, you comic and you're drawing, you know, you're, you're an artist, you're not wasting your time as a child, you know, as opposed to, oh, you have to be a lawyer, you have to be a doctor, and stuff like that. Now, my question is 
please, would you? I mean, it's good to know that you engage in terms, you know, from Pan African University, but I think at that stage, you know, um, they are already um, young adults. I'm looking at the children, you know, whose parents are trying to stop from uh, things like gaming too much, like when the other man spoke, you know, on the gaming thing. I, I mean, I find it really ridiculous when I find a child, you know, gaming all day. And um, like he also said, it, it's difficult to put a name to the things that they do, you know, because parents don't understand it. I think it's important to start putting names to this thing so that we say, oh, your child is following the path. However, I'm just wondering, can boot camps be organized for children, for kids, you know, uh, maybe um, primary school kids, so that um, they attend and then we we'll actually begin to connect these things and then they are not lost before they get to university and then have to in intern and then come back and change, you know, everything that they have all already studied. And, like, I mean, we always say you study one thing and then you think about it. Can I go first? Can I go first? <laughs> okay. Um, so, it's a quick, very fast story. My mom, I remember one time I came back from school and my mom had been waiting for me outside when I was drawing. And I was in one classroom, corner drawing because I didn't want to be stop. And she was looking for me till 5 p.m. School closed at 1. And um, apparently, she had sent someone home to put all my comics in a box, close to the the comics. And then she took me off, she beat me, and she beat the comics on fire. Oh um, fast forward, CNN was following me around for a day to interview me. And of course, part of it was my mom saying she knew I was going to make it to come. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the thing about being a creative. You know, looking at it for again, I have been very satisfied, but it takes you 10,000 hours to master anything, right? And creative work is actually very difficult. So, I would say that you know, between the ages of one to 15, I would say that your child on their own has to go through the perseverance of being a creative and going through you as a parent, it's part of the training and being sure that that's what they want to do. Right. And then by the time they get into school and they want to focus on a particular passion, right? If they're able to survive to that point in time, then they have to resilience to go through the creative process as it is. Because it's actually laborious work for our, right? Which is why we need a big team of almost 200 creatives to do the work that we do. But then again, it's also it's a responsibility of people like myself, and just like the music industry has done to show, to actually bring proof of how profitable the business is, right? Um, you know, just quick story with my assistant and, you know, um, she was shocked when I called her, I said, look, I have to come into the bus tomorrow. Right? I said, I'm not going to say that she show up, right? And she attended the meeting with me and we had the, the um, head of international affairs for Amazon and content of this region. And all they were just talking about is, forget about explaining your work to us, where do we start? Which character do we start with? Now, that is a discussion that could easily lead to the other words. If that happens, I won't need to convince you that you allow your child to do this work. So, just like everything else, it's people like me that have to put the um, infrastructure in place to show parents that your child is not wasting their time in following the creative path and that it's actually possible. But truth is, if you look at the world worldwide, the biggest players in the movie industry right now is easily Disney, which is focused mainly really on creative work. Disney bought Marvel Studios, a studio focused on making comic characters for $4.5 billion. Right. That was the purchasing price. You don't want to look into series like Flash that are making a million dollars in profit every episode. Now, when I say profit, it means they've made more than that. So if the, the way the world is going, it's going to be very interesting for parents, just like the music industry. Because I remember a time when I was going to be saying I did music, your parents would keep the life out of me. But it has gone to that point. And we, we, the way the creative space and the creative space is going, right? I mean, Amazon is not in Nigeria for, it, not because they, 
a life of this institute is because our creative industry is growing very fast. People like myself, people like him, people like him, we need to lay that capacity and infrastructure. We need to train the young ones to be professionals. And I do feel that as a point when they get to university and they start to understand the necessity to make a living, that we can actually train them. So I personally would not recommend a boot camp between one and 15. I'll say let them decide that they want to go into this profession on their own. And the parents, all the parents need to do is that whatever they decide to go with, they should just support them because these, the richest people in the world today are not the family. Right? Facebook, Amazon, I can go and they're the guys in the crypto space. So if you look at that and you're really serious about what you can get a line kicks, the creators will be on as well. Um, so I, I grew up in a uh, quite wicked as oil town and everybody wanted to work in oil. In fact, I spent some time working in oil. And it was the only thing that we knew how to do. It was the only thing you knew was a path to emancipation. And so I, we, I grew up poor and then my mom got a job in an oil company and all of a sudden, like we were middle class and we got to that. <laughs> and so um, she obviously, I could not, never thank my mother for wanting me to be a certain way. And so we, I got my parents to get a computer in the house, taught myself to use a computer, taught myself to design code and everything. But every time my mom was going to watch in lock the room, so you will not spoil it. Of course, like I can understand why she does not want to spoil that thing as an investment. She didn't grow up seeing that. And so so we also have to be sympathetic to people who do not know any different. My parents didn't know any different. And and so when they come back and I'm doing this thing, it's it's wahala. It's why your mom burned that thing because she didn't see a path to the future. I, I do not blame her one bit. You know, all she wants for this child to have is reasonable success growing up. And it's difficult to tell what to be successful. And and that said, um, I think that the biggest answer to that is being, like you said, successful and, and being able to share that success in a way that encourages parents. Now, I'm, I'm a multi-whatever person. I, I'm, I'm as much a scientist and tech guy as I am a creator. You know, I, I recognize that as I evolved. And so I have a nine-year-old son who's drawn over 250 new and original Pokemon. It's his thing, it's Pokemon. And he does a, he does a Minecraft. Now, because it beats gaming and playing um, stuff out of me because of gambling, that it's gambling. My, my father bought, like, beats the, uh, the attraction for gaming and stuff out of me. I can't play video games. My child, on the other hand, does we build walls of Minecraft, but he's been doing it since he was seven. And I let him do it. And so now, like he's 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 been top of his class every year since he was three years old, since he started school. And so he is he has got the academics down. He sucks at sports. <laughs> you know, but he is when he started doing Pokemon, I you know, he's now he's done hundreds and hundreds. This is like his, his main library. You know, his 200 prime Pokemon that he does and describes and everything is, is the process of digitizing them now. And that's something he is naturally interested in. So, the f best thing you can do for a kid is expose them. And what they want to do, they choose to do. I, I, I'm not a believer in telling people what to do or children what they should be. It, it never really works out. I, I, I got up one day and said, I'm not going to do this oil thing. My mom nearly passed out. Yeah, but I wasn't really going to think because it wasn't what I really wanted to do. The experience was great, but okay, thanks, bye bye. Now, on the logistics thing, here, I, I'm, a be, I'm basically an existentialist. You've got to be able to, to, to crawl, walk, and run, and then you can think of fly. And so Nollywood, for example, has come to be in our way. People think that old Nollywood was so much better than new Nollywood. This is not true. It's fundamentally flawed. You know, the infrastructure is better today because people did that thing with the steps. You know, we are on Netflix today because neck videos did glamour girls. 
we cannot sit down and say global girls was better. It was an important footstool to where we are now. And so there is a path to building studios and infrastructure like that. There is a clear path. Um, it starts with actually needing to build studios for stories. It starts with actually having experience with building studio, uh, building sets of studios. We we build sets on on studio grounds. We build sets outside studio. But you do not have need. You need to have twenty black books every year to require building big studios like that. You know, black book is like one standalone. So you talk about like at least you need you need. Um, 20 a year, $20 million to raise every year, you know, to, to support that studio structure that you're talking about. And so that means that you have to do the investment that, you know, that would be paid back by this $20 million production system every year. You know, that's what justifies that. You know, you cannot, when the industry does not support such, um, it can only support the industry at the moment, it can only support so many big stories. You know, until we unlock that that market, it does not make sense to make big investments like that. That would cover, say, Tyler Perry Studio. But there are small studios that are being built that are actually getting. I mean, I've built the studio, small studios, so that tells you that the work is being done already. You know, but I think that for the work that work to be done at the scale that you asked for, it just it would take time. It would be for it might be five years that would happen because things are moving really, really fast. Um, but you will never ever be able to shoot everything in studio studio environments. Never, never happen. Not in Hollywood. Hollywood still blocks for it to shoot. You know, so uh, this is what we can do now. Keep pushing, keep innovating, keep growing, and things will naturally evolve to a place where we would be happy to do things like Hollywood does. Yeah, just so I uh, really quickly, I'm I'm so sorry and. I wish we could keep going, honestly. Um, but this is what happens when you have panels like this at the very end, where you get to see the back end and you get excited about the stories. And, you know, I'm really happy that, especially, you know, Murewa, Chide, Editi, uh, Kunmi were here because you told the real stories, right? You told the realities. It wasn't just uh, fluff. It wasn't, you know, something that you write for a glossy marketing campaign or anything. You were giving real stories. And I think that's why the entire crowd got really energized and we had these questions and people wanted to go deeper. Um, but now we have run to the end <laughs> of the end of the program. Um, so unfortunately, anyone who wants to continue the conversation with any of these gentlemen, you'll have to do it um, after. And thankfully we do have a session uh, coming um, after this for snacks at uh, Taraka, the restaurant um, in the same building. Um, so uh, there are some people in the hall who will uh, direct you to that location. And I hope that you'll continue this conversation. But I think the key above all is that anyone who has listened to their stories as creative business owners understands that we can talk at the high level all we want about IP frameworks, about government intervention, all of that. But unless we take into account the very real situations that creatives are going through to bring about the quality of storytelling that resonates not only locally, but globally, then we're not even starting a real conversation. And I think that's why it was important to have this panel because stakeholders need to understand the realities. When you go about and you talk about policies and you talk about enforcement and you talk about you know, what needs to be done, you can only do that if you know what's been done and what is being done, right? So I hope you will take these stories to heart. Um, and, I, and again, I hope that you continue to have these conversations with people um, like um, Murewa, Editi, and Jide, because it's, it's massively important that we continue this conversation. Um, thank you so much for everyone who participated. Thank you to our panelists. Uh, we can't thank you enough to, you know, for honestly sharing all of these stories and your journey. Uh, thank you to the audience. 
Um, and uh, on behalf of the American Business Council, Ohana LA Law Firm, Panuka Solicitors, and um, we, we're so happy that you all could join us today for this uh, session, for this program. Um, and we're really excited because the goal is action, right? The goal is to see some measurable activities coming out of these conversations, not just an opportunity to talk and reminisce and reflect, but actually to take action. So we invite you to continue these conversations um, and we hope you will be open to some of the exciting opportunities we're looking to uh, pull you all into uh, in the near future. Um, so thank you all so, so very much. A round of applause for this amazing panel. Just absolutely amazing. Thank you.